A good August 5th to you on this Thursday morning, and welcome to this episode of Real Talk. Ryan Jesperson here with you. This show is presented by the team at Bitcoin Well. They've been experiencing a big week at Bitcoin Well, becoming the first Bitcoin ATM company in the world to be publicly traded. Our congratulations to the team at Bitcoin Well. They're trading on the TSX Venture Exchange. We heard from a real talker by the name of Michael, who let me know he thought this was a great opportunity. He was like, I am in. Now, of course, I would never tell you which stocks to buy. I would never tell you to buy crypto or not to buy crypto. But what I do tell you is if you have questions about crypto or you're intrigued by crypto, This is the team to talk to at Bitcoin Well under the Sponsors tab at RyanJesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. We've got a great show in store coming up in uh, just a few minutes. Looking forward to checking in with Dr. Vivian Stamatopoulos. It's tough to book Dr. Stamatopoulos because when you want to talk about long-term care in Canada, she is, uh, in, in my mind, the preeminent voice, and we're excited to get her. She's been uh, certainly, I think, giving us a lot to think about over the course of the last year and a half or so when it comes to the COVID implications on long-term care, and, and then now we'll be able to have uh, different, I, I think, maybe updated conversations with her, including uh, her take on mandatory vaccinations in long-term care centers, her perspective on public versus private delivery of long-term care. And I'm uh, looking forward to, I mean, the timing of this works out really well. Just a short time ago, uh, Canada's uh, parliamentary budget officer, Yves Giroux, uh, that would just be a nightmare job as far as I'm concerned. I'm somebody that I I love. I, I don't do my own taxes. I can barely balance things. Numbers freak me out. I've never been a big math person. The job of parliamentary budget officer to me would just make my skin crawl, but we're lucky to have people that do it. And Yves Giroux came out with a report that said, listen, if we're going to implement the changes that are being recommended, if we're going to update and better equip long-term care centers, if we're going to provide the equipment that they need, if we're going to pay staff what they should be paid to deliver this important service, Canada's going to have to pony up nearly $14 billion, about $13.7 billion. So we'll get... Uh, Vivian's take on that. She's coming up in just a few minutes. A little bit later on in the show, we're not quite sure how this is going to work out. So we've we've got two physicians that have agreed to talk to us about the Alberta government relaxing its COVID measures. You might say moving on from its COVID restrictions. Uh, Dr. Joe Vipond, who's done some organizing, a significant amount of organizing when it comes to these protests that you've been seeing in Edmonton and Calgary over the past number of days, and Dr. Lenora Saxinger. The one complication is that Dr. Saxinger has intermittently been in touch with us. She's on vacation, first of all, I hate to bug her, second of all, in an area without reliable Wi-Fi. So we actually don't know. We will find out as this happens whether or not it's going to work for her to be with us today or tomorrow. The team's been working on it behind the scenes. I'm hoping to have them on together. If it doesn't work out, we're going to have them back to back uh, two different days here on Real Talk. And we'll be able to uh, get their perspectives on you know, some of the thoughts and the theories behind uh, what is being sold by this provincial government, by Alberta's provincial government, as Dr. Dina Hinshaw's plan, right, as Alberta's chief medical officer of health's plan to essentially stop contact tracing, to stop requiring people with positive COVID tests to isolate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think by this point, people recognize or understand exactly what's going on with that. Of course, these are phased in over the next number of weeks. By the end of August, basically, uh, you may say I'm being sensational, but but is it fair to say that, I don't know if you want to call it a free-for-all, but essentially the province of Alberta will be back to how things were in 2019, really treating COVID-19 like the flu. And so we'll pick both doctors' brains on that when we have a chance to talk to them. In about an hour and a half from now, I'm expecting a a fascinating and and somewhat uh, harsh conversation. The harsh reality of, of, of humans and what humans can do when it comes to impacting populations of other animals, in this case, birds. Dr. John Roden's going to lead uh, our discussion here. He's with Audubon's bird-friendly communities strategy. And uh, he earned his doctorate in zoology out of Duke University. And the good doctor is going to explain to us. Before I go any further, Sarah, am I going to am I going to demolish or spoil or ruin the poll that you have going on the Real Talk Twitter account if we reveal? Am I going to re- reveal anything that we don't want to reveal here? 
Nah, right go now. for it. Go for it. Well, do you want to talk about it? Let's let's call it up and let's see how people are doing here. Early, uh, you posted this. What was this like? Sort of mid afternoon yesterday. Yep. And uh, this, of course, as as we do, uh, this is an unofficial, unscientific Twitter poll. But you basically asked real talkers and those that follow us at Real Talk RJ. That's our brand spanking new Twitter account. What kills six hundred million birds every year? in the United States. And you gave us the options, cats, buildings, airplanes, and power lines. So far to this point, just under 42% of respondents, we have 611 votes, 42% believe it to be cats. A distant second at 28% believe it to be buildings. Uh, 16% believe it to be power lines. And 15, 14.6% believe it to be airplanes. Uh, we don't have wind turbines on there, which is an interesting one. But but I suspect that you're about to tell us that the majority here is incorrect. Well, they're sort of correct in that cats, feral cats, do kill a, lo- a lot of birds. Okay. But 600 million birds a year? Buildings. Buildings. This includes people's houses. Includes big skyscrapers, it includes urban and rural infrastructure. This is just across the United States, 600 million birds a year. Basically, two birds per human living in the U.S. Yikes. When Every blood- human has the blood of, of two, two birds. birds on their hands. Don't make light of it. I'm not making light. Do <laughs> birds even have blood? Yes, yeah, they when they okay. smash into the window <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not and you see either. that little mark on it and then you I run know, outside and go check if, to... if the bird is still there. Can you can you help them? And that's ultimately what it is. It's it's not just the building. So like they're ramming their heads into brick wall. It's that they're they're seeing like as a lot of folks would know lights on. It looks like there's a reflection. They see like they feel like they can actually go somewhere Uh fantastical we nope, have it's uh, a window our uh my, my parents-in-law have a, a wonderful they've built their beautiful retirement home uh in the province of saskatchewan outside humboldt in middle lake it's just a really beautiful part of the country it's kind of the rolling hills and i mean there's you know you uh, at their property at any given moment maybe a moose is walking through or you know you see porcupines and really all kinds of cool stuff a uh, ton of snow geese like you would not believe how many snow geese it's almost a spiritual experience when you see them flying over and birds of all sorts and they have what you might describe as a uh, they would never i don't think they would call it this but it's like a bird sanctuary almost i mean all these different types of houses and platforms and feeders and perches and, and you'll see I'm, I'm trying to think of some of the species gosh i wish they were here to clarify because i'm going to blow it and get it wrong but but all kinds of cool birds you know like the last time we were there it's a cardinal like you don't see cardinals all the time and all kinds of neat species and they're able to you know all different sizes and styles of woodpecker styles types of woodpeckers and you know what i'm saying uh, so it'll surprise everyone to know i'm not an ornithologist i'm I'm not a zoologist uh, but i can appreciate it we got one coming up though so thank goodness yeah the point of all of this is that they have these massive beautiful kitchen windows right by their bird sanctuary and they have decals on them of birds right mm. the outlines of birds to to remind our feathered friends that this is not a passageway through you know that this will be a sudden awakening Or as they might say in martial arts, a good night now were you to hit that glass. So, you know, I'd I'd be curious to hear from real talkers with regards to steps maybe that that our audience members are taking across the country to protect migratory birds and and the like. Well, the great thing about this zoologist is that he actually he heads up bird safety communities like that's his whole project. So he can give us great ideas for how to to actually do that so if you are a uh, a landlord or if you are a homeowner or a renter or if you are in charge of office towers this interview will have valuable takeaway for you that's coming up in an hour and 20 minutes or so before we get to dr vivian stavitopoulos looking forward to that conversation we want to remind you that right now if you're in our neck of the woods if, as a matter of fact if you're across the province of alberta into saskatchewan and you're looking to get away you're ready to you know Head out internationally, take the family somewhere. You know, you can fly nonstop right now from Edmonton to Amsterdam, nonstop with KLM. That starts August 19th, two weeks from today. And if you're going to take advantage of that opportunity, why not self park at Jet Set Parking Edmonton? You're not going to get any closer 
to the departures gate for the price when you book online at jetsetparking.com. And here's the deal. If you use the promo code REALTALK, this is a wild deal. You can park at the airport for $5 a day. $5 a day with the promo code REALTALK at jetsetparking.com. That's for any travel to the end of 2022. Jet Set Parking is locally owned, and trust me, you will love dealing with them. We also want to remind you that it's no secret. You don't have to tell me. Running a small business isn't easy. Life as a business owner is hectic, to say the least. Why not let Alberta Blue Cross help you find a little peace of mind with a group benefit plan? They offer flexible health, dental, life, and disability coverage for your employees. Even better, your employees can enroll and manage their coverage at any time on any device, making life easier for them, easier for you. Alberta Blue Cross. Explore your options at ab.bluecross.ca. ab.bluecross.ca. Well, it doesn't matter what stage you're at in life. Long-term care will impact you at some point. That's inevitable. Whether it's you yourself, whether it's a loved one, chances are issues around long-term care, if not right now, will be on your radar. Dr. Vivian Stamatopoulos has been driving these conversations across the country for a long time, and most especially over the past year and a half as COVID-19 has wreaked havoc across many of Canada's long-term care centers. She's an associate teaching professor at Ontario Tech University. Her research specializes in caregiving and long-term care in Canada. It is so good to have you on the show, Vivian. Thanks for making time for us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. You've, you've really, I mean, I, I've got to applaud you. I've been seeing you on national news outlets for a long time and, and, and offering commentary. It's been fascinating to me. I mean, your area of, of specialty, of course, is long-term care. There have been... I mean, if you take a look at the impact of COVID-19 on communities, on populations, there have been these mile markers over the past year and a half where you've been sounding the alarm. Has anybody been more affected or more impacted by COVID-19 than people living and working in long-term care? No, that is a hard no. I don't know if people know this, but between, what was it, uh, March? So March 2020 to February 2021, so the first and second waves, over 14,000 Canadians died in long-term care and over 30 staff. This accounts for two-thirds of all the COVID deaths in Canada. So not for nothing, this has been the tragedy of COVID-19, has been what happened. This, what I call, you know, mass casualty event slash long-term care crisis of our century. And the fact that we still have seen very little change in this area to me is mind blowingly upsetting. So people are going to, you know, I mean, I know that people will that will seek to diminish the numbers, uh, you know, to write off these numbers. We'll say these are people in their 80s, people with compromised health conditions. You're already shaking your head. I don't even need to get a question out. What would you say to them? Um. Well, there's words that, you know, instinctively I want to say. They're not nice ones, but I'm going to refrain. And I'm just going to say that what if that was your mother? What if that was your father? What if that was your grandmother or your grandfather? I mean, you cannot use that ridiculously ageist argument. It is so cruel and so offensive. And the fact that you would even try to put that kind of argument forward is, you know, explicitly what we've seen done in many other populations where certain groups have been targeted quite frankly, and, you know, I, I refer to a gentleman who wrote about this very nicely, uh, very smartly, in the, you know, right at the start of the pandemic, Elliot Kukla in the New York Times, I believe, that how to him this was, you know, the, the pestilence of ableism and ageism that had been unleashed in, during COVID-19 that we had never seen before. But, but similar things we had seen, you know, during uh, the Nazi reign, of course, when they would target certain groups. So this is not unlike that kind of situation where you're saying certain lives are disposable. And overwhelmingly, the the arguments that have been levied, you know, along this line have been against seniors, you know, oh, they're at the end of their lives. Oh, they, you know, it, it's okay if they die a terrible COVID death. I mean, what would even possess anyone to suggest this, let alone say it out loud? And usually I find it's very right wing, um, you know, anti, you know, these tend to go hand in hand, anti-vaxxers, anti-maskers that tend to, you know, 
know, diminish the lives of certain groups of people because heaven forbid any some sort of restrictions on their daily living might make life uncomfortable for them. I just have no time for that kind of rhetoric. None. It's despicable. So and I'm going to talk to you about mandatory vaccinations and long term care centers in just a moment. I want to ask you about that. But let me ask you, generally speaking, of the approximately 14,000 people that lost their lives uh, in long term care centers due to COVID-19. How many of those? I mean, this is a subjective question, of course, but you're the expert. How many of those deaths could have been prevented and how could they have been prevented, do you think? Oh, I know how they could have been prevented. We'll never know the exact number, but if we're going to take a, a you know a guess, let's say a very conservative amount, I would say at least half, mm-hmm. at least half, given the fact that you know when we look at Ontario in particular, where I've been focusing most of my uh, emphasis, it really in particular the pandemic response by our provincial government, because of course the the fault is twofold here, right? We had a predominantly for-profit sector that failed overwhelmingly in Ontario. We know we have the data there. The data doesn't lie. I believe uh, the Toronto Star, which did the most recent comprehensive investigation of of deaths from over the first wave and the second wave, uh, found that it was 7.3 COVID deaths for every 100 registered beds in for-profit homes, going all the way down to just 1.7, I believe, in the municipal homes. And then the not-for-profit homes were somewhere in the middle there. So, I mean, there's a drastic differential. There's no question about it. And it's also not lost on me that of the, I can't even count, we're well past hundreds now, probably into thousands of individuals, families that have reached out to me during, you know, this last 500 plus days, uh, you know, that easily 90% of them have been families of residents in for-profit facilities. And the horror stories that I have heard would keep you up at night and, and, you know, obviously underpin the anger that I have when I, when I talk about this and when I see, you know, individuals who approach it so cavalierly, like these lives don't matter. And what these families went through has been, you know, something they'll never get over. Right. And, and even, sorry. No, go ahead. Even in the long-term care commission, right, the testimony revealed that this was so traumatizing for these residents and these staff that the commissioner said that they should be provided like immediate mental health counseling for what they went through. And and frankly, that counseling needs to be extended to the families of these individuals. Remember, they were locked out and kept away from these loved ones, knowing what was happening, seeing all the military reports, seeing the news stories of, of damning neglect and abuse and preventable death. I mean, story after story, every easily nine tenths of the military occupied homes that we heard about were preventable errors. Things like putting, you know, hiring all these workers that had zero healthcare training or expertise. You threw them on the floor with no IPAC information, no training. And then what do you expect is going to happen in addition to not providing them proper PPE in the early days? It was a disaster, a preventable disaster. If you actually safeguarded these facilities, like acute care was safeguarded, right? And that's fundamentally because hospitals are covered under the Canada Health Act in a way that long-term care isn't. And that was a big mistake, big mistake by our federal government back in the 80s not to include long-term care more formally. And there's reasons for that as well. That's a separate conversation we can go down. But, But the point is that if we had safeguarded these facilities like hospitals were, we wouldn't have seen what happened happened, right? The hospitals were protected. You didn't see these outbreaks. You didn't see these deaths in hospitals. You saw them in long-term care. And that is because it has been consistently and chronically underfunded and unfortunately increasingly privatized with Ontario being the greatest example with the largest share of for-profit long-term care ownership. Has your, you, you, you've mentioned for-profit or private versus public delivery several times. Um, and, and, and it's quite clear that you have strong feelings about this. Have your feelings become stronger or more emboldened over the past year and a half? Or have you always felt the way that you do? You know, I didn't, I always felt to a certain extent this way, because obviously, you know, I'm a PhD in political, feminist political economy. So I've studied in healthcare. So my research has been, you know, consistently on family caregiving, not necessarily within long-term care. I started researching long-term care during the pandemic because of what I saw happening and because of these families reaching out to me and just wanting to contribute whatever way I could. Um, But it is... I knew the numbers, I knew the data, I knew how, you know, public delivery of healthcare is obviously so much safer, more efficient, you name it. Even when you compare Canada and, and the U.S. as an example, I mean, there's no question. And healthcare is our, you know, most valued public institution, consistently rated in survey after survey. We love our healthcare and we should. Um, and, you know, the fact that we just didn't do this with long-term care is one thing. But then, you know, I had previous experience in long-term care, not even in for-profit, but 
when I started to, you know, when the pandemic hit and, you know, I had my own experiences with long-term care. So I had that lived experience. I understood the larger systemic problems because keep in mind, you know, ownership aside, these, you know, there's been consistent underfunding in long-term care. So the problems exist across the board. However, there's obviously a continuum of, you know, <laughs> optimal and then really terrible. And we tend to find, and the data would substantiate that the for-profit delivery uh, is terrible for, for many different reasons that are very publicly stated. And, and, and the data is all there, pre pandemic and all throughout. Um, so yes, without any, you know, question did my thoughts on the dangers of for profit, particularly in long term care increase over the course of COVID. I'm, 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 I'm almost forecasting a response from private long term care corporations yep. or deliverers or however you want to call them uh, that will be in touch with the show that'll say, hang on a second. Um, you know, they'll say Dr. Stamatopoulos makes some great points. And there are there are certainly some horror stories that we've all seen about private or for profit long term care centers across the country. But what we offer is a choice to people that want to have better food and more square footage. <laughs> and we want people to have options. That's what they would say. Right. Well, sure, they can say that, but the evidence doesn't suggest this. This goes hand in hand with that myth that, you know, the for-profit sector provides more creativity because they have deep pockets. B.S. Frankly, even if you look in the data, you look in the evidence, Pat Armstrong has written about this for two decades. All of her research corroborates this, in addition to the Long-Term Care Commission testimony, which showed in various elements that not only did the municipal homes fundraise over and above uh, to do things like, for example, provide fresh fruit and vegetables, which we're not hearing about to the same degree in the for-profit homes, because it's all about cutting costs to provide those, you know, profits to the shareholders and the CEOs. Fundamentally, that is their main fiduciary responsibility to create profit. It's not to provide a wonderful living experience. That is not their fundamental primary goal, right? This is the whole point of, of providing profit for shareholders. You have to maximize profit. Somebody suffers in that equation. We see who suffers. It's the residents and it's the staff time and time again. So that is BS. And furthermore, the city of Toronto homes is one beautiful example. Above and beyond, uh, fundraised over 20 million a year and a half ago to institute the minimum four hour care standard on their own when we are being only guaranteed promises that we'll get it in five years by this government, which is laughable and insulting. And furthermore, the evidence actually shows that that you know, uh, four hour care standard was actually agreed upon by experts over a decade ago. So when you actually look at the increasing acuity of these residents, you need to actually increase that number to between five to seven hours. Charlene Harrington is a big expert in the States that has provided those valuations. So the evidence is there, the evidence is clear. Um, so it's just, you know, they're nice words, but they don't bear out in the literature is what I'd say. Daniel's watching us live right now on YouTube, and he says how we treated our elders before and during COVID is a blight on Canadian yeah. society. Daniel says I worked in a few long term care centers and I left the industry. I yeah. was disgusted. Why do you think it is? I mean, you know, we, we talk about the greatest generation. I mean, there's lip service everywhere. It's kind of what we do as human yeah. beings, isn't it? Uh, and, and, we, and we thank those. We talk about the people that built this country. We talk about the, oh, the yeah. greatest generation. But we sure don't treat them that well. No. We don't put we our sure money don't. where our mouth is, right? No, we sure don't. It, it is a lot of lip service. And, it, you know, I'll be honest, until it really hits home, and you have an experience with this entire sector. And, and granted, I had my own experiences with first home care because I was like most long term care families. They try to keep their loved ones at home as long as humanly possible. But at some point, invariably, you can't. Right. You need 24 seven care, you know, when you're getting towards the, the later stages of your life and the care needs become, you know, really extensive. Some families just do not have an option unless you expect quite often. And the expectation is there for, for the women in the household, often the female children to just what quit their jobs and, and suddenly become overnight unpaid healthcare skilled workers. And many do this, by the way, many do this. This is also well established. The, the very highly gendered uh, value nature of reproductive unpaid care labor. This is what we call it, that unpaid care, you know, care labor that sustains our population, which is done for free in private households, which was done by full-time stay-at-home mothers for, you know, ever before the 80s when we really started to enter the workforce. And that's also why we left out long-term care because at that time when it was created, the Canada Health Act, we had this stay-at-home army of reproductive mothers and daughters who did this very difficult and dangerous labor without training for free in private households. And we just banked on that involvement. But as the second stage of capitalism came and we needed women to fuel that, you know, advanced stage of predatory global capitalism, we needed women. 
And women also wanted to work. Don't get me wrong. I love that I have that opportunity. And I would never suggest that we go back. Um, but at the same time that this very drastic, you know, generational shift happened, the state never compensated the fact that we lost this very significant reserve army of unpaid laborers. And then, you know, many women are still doing these double, triple burdens um, or unpaid shifts, working shifts. You know, Arlie Hochschild has been famous for, for that research um, privately on their own, but it's becoming unsustainable. So long-term care is going to increase and has increased over the past two decades and will only get worse was, you know, with the future generations of women, particularly considering we're having smaller households, more people are, you know, childless and unmarried and are not going to have people to be able to provide that family caregiving for free. So people really need to start thinking forward because of, the, of all generations, it is going to be the millennials and, and certainly, you know, the generation before them that are going to need long-term care probably more than any generation before it. And it would really behoove them to see this as the election issue it is and to really start working towards improving this system because they will invariably need it. Home care is nowhere near the place it could be to actually sustain these older adults aging at home safely and securely in place right now. It's just not. If you're listening to us live streaming uh, via the Mixler audio app, we're talking to Dr. Vivian Stamatopoulos, a long-term care expert. I was mentioning just before we brought you in uh, to the stream, and, and, and obviously you're aware of this, the Parliamentary Budget Officer, Yves Giroux, has suggested that making mm -hmm. recommended long-term care improvements across the country would cost approximately, I know people don't like the word cost, but let me just say, it would take about $13.7 billion. It's yeah. actually just about identically the amount that governments spend per year on long-term care in Canada. In other words, they'd have to double up. Uh, your thoughts yeah. on that? Um, 100%. There's no question that, that, that this has been significant and dangerous underinvestment that has led us to the situation we're in right now, right? Only exacerbated and intensified by allowing the for-profit sector to just creep its way into here. Um, we, there's no question. Listen, the CCPA, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, early on in the pandemic created an estimate of how much it would cost, just Ontario alone, to bring the care standard up alone to four hours. So to provide four hours of daily care per resident. We're at, some, we're at right now 2.7, which frankly, it's lower than that in many homes. But let's just say 2.7, which is a horrifying neglect. I mean, you cannot provide basic care with that level. So just trying to get to four would result in the hiring of an additional 51% of caregiving hours and would cost 1.8 billion. So that's just one province alone. So of course, that is a, a pretty, in my opinion, that's even you know an, an underestimation of how much it would actually cost to not only create the care standard, but to deal with the consistent undervaluation of this labor. So pay increases for the lowest wage earners that do the majority of work in these homes, that is personal support workers, PSWs, an unregulated, largely racialized female population who has been exploited for decades. Um, and by the way, it's also not a coincidence that as in Ontario is my you know, prime example, the for-profit sector really leaned in and took hold of the uh, sector um, from, you know, mid 80s till now, thanks to Mike Harris really, really hit this home in his reign in the 90s, um, that we saw a complete reversal of the staffing structure in these homes. So, you know, 20, 30 years ago, long term care homes were staffed primarily by nurses who are a highly paid, highly trained, regulated profession. And then you see as the for profits come in and have to find ways to, you know, cut labor costs to shore out more profits, you see that all of a sudden, now we have the complete opposite. We have the PSWs who are an unregulated profession that are the large, the, the largest share of workers in long-term care. And now the nurses have become the minority. So if you, anyone that cannot put, you know, those puzzle pieces together on their own, isn't looking close enough, right? This has been a structural overtime um, method at devaluing this labor, exploiting this workforce to create profits and, and to really, the, the end result is to increase the neglect and the preventable error and the injuries and the abuse that occurs in these homes, because it is horrifying. The numbers of residents that incur preventable errors, medication errors, falls, injuries that should never happen simply because the staff, there aren't enough of them, plainly. And secondly, they're not trained properly.
They don't have the skills to properly engage in this very difficult and skilled labor, which is why they end up quitting because they're forced in conditions of labor where they're designed to fail. And then you wonder why we have a constantly revolving door. Mm -hmm. So dealing with the care standard is one thing, but until they also throw money at the persistently low wages for the now majority PSW workforce in this sector, they won't, nothing will change. Uh, you can follow uh, Dr. Stamatopoulos on Twitter at Dr. Vivian S. I highly recommend you do. That's where you amplified a piece, an op-ed that ran in the Toronto Star by Dr. Gillian Orton, who described Canada as a place where yeah. the, mo- the moral authority of our institutions is broken. Now, I know when we think of health care, we think of the federal government as somewhat of a regulator and one that mm-hmm. sends transfer payments. We think of the provinces yeah. as the governing bodies that actually administer and roll out health care. So who is this on? Is this on Premier Kenny and Premier Ford and Premier Mo and Premier Horgan? Is this on the prime minister? I mean, where does this start or how does this play out? Yeah, I mean, fundamentally... It, right now, it's on the premiers. There's no question, right? But at the same time, and why we have been fighting to get national standards or to get a buy-in program, right? Similar to how the Canada Health Act and Medicare was established in the 80s, is that you, you know, you got to provide, a, you know, a, a carrot program, right? So here, we're going to offer provinces a certain amount of money if you do some basic standards. And we have had meetings with the federal government, who so far have not listened to what we have said, um, to just point out a handful of very important and, and, and manageable, you know, actionable items that provinces can buy into and evidence and history shows us that they will buy into it to get the money. Um, and then think because of that, we have our universal public health care that we have right now. Um, so that's what we wanted to see. Right. And Trudeau himself, Prime Minister Trudeau, I remember in the um, his uh, he had a, what was it called? Oh, God, the throne speech. That's it. The throne speech where he talked about criminal standards, um, criminal charges for these bad actors and really improving the standards. So what is the delay? Just create a very basic program where they can buy in, have very key actionable standards like a 70 30 split split of full time and part time workers in these homes. Very manageable things like this, having standardized pay and training for the different occupational tiers. And they don't even have to necessarily pay that because obviously you would put that charge on the for-profit providers who obviously don't want to pay any some sort of real pay increases that would be on their dime, but force them to, please, for the love of God. Because what we have seen is that you can't just say, ah, do it on your own goodwill or let different premiers do it because A, They don't. Mm. And what we see is that it's not fair to have this disproportionate response where maybe you live in a province that has a decent premiere and and they'll do something about it. But then if you live in other ones like mine, you're SOL. Mm. Right. Because I would be terrified right now if I had to live in long term care. And I'm pretty sure anyone in Ontario uh, would say the same thing. Right. Given the pandemic failed response to actually protect these residents. It's and it's you know, it's I mean, I'm stating all the obvious to you. I almost just want to keep telling you to keep going as opposed to jumping in with my own hot takes. But it's like, you know, oftentimes you take a look at at populations that are marginalized or ignored or even abused. And it's the populations that typically don't have the voice. Right. And because they're easily ignored. And this is certainly the case here. You know, I want to talk a bit more about the staff. I mean, one of yeah. one of I think the the tragic realities of COVID nineteen was when you looked at how, um, and in particular, I mean, in Ontario, and you've cited this military reporting. I mean, we heard stories you know more oh. than I do about about Canadian men and women in the armed forces that were mm-hmm. that were in tears, that were appalled. These are people that have oh, served yeah. overseas that were appalled horrified. at what they were seeing, horrified on home soil, writing these letters, coming yeah. forward. They were blowing the whistle. I mean, and one oh, of the God. stories that they were reporting, and one of the things that we learned was that COVID nineteen was spreading between care centers because staff members were moving between care centers and a lot of blame and a lot of ire fell on the shoulders of these staff members and part of me that was trying to be empathetic and that was trying to understand was sitting there going these people are making minimum wage working probably two full-time jobs trying to keep their families afloat i'm pretty sure they're not intentionally spreading COVID 19 you've advocated for these workers uh in many different contexts but but do you think the general public is really aware of some of the challenges that these people are facing? These are the people that are on the very front lines of care delivery for our senior citizens. No, because frankly, not enough people who are advocates in the area 
uh, have an understanding or an appreciation of the staffing conditions in these homes and aren't speaking up loud enough. Yeah. Like I'm doing my part, but I can only yell so loud and I can only do so many interviews, right? And I've done over, I don't even know, 250 now. I mean, there's only so much I can do as one person doing this as a volunteer side gig that I don't get paid for on top of my full-time job, right? So I want people to know I don't get paid for any of this. This is out of the goodness of my heart because I've talked to these family members and I've talked to these staff and I've heard what they've been through and it's just wrong. And I'm one of those people that when I see something, you know, see something, say something, that's just how I'm hardwired. <laughs> so <laughs> even if it makes my life a little, you know, more difficult and I probably gained some enemies in the process, that's fine. So be it. That's what has to happen because what I'm seeing is despicable. It's abhorrent. It has to change. It's gone on for far too long. And, and, and if we're not going to do something now, when what we saw unfolded was probably never, we'll, we will never see that again, at least in our lifetimes. We're never going to see a tragedy that that terrible. And if we don't do anything now, when when will we? Honestly, when will we? If this doesn't precipitate the kinds of significant, and I'm talking overwhelming reform that is very obviously needed, when will we? And what I'm seeing right now is that governments are passing the buck. They're trying to delay actually creating the kinds of reforms we need so that people forget about it until what the next election is over. And I'm starting to get very hardened and, and frankly, very, you know, upset with our politicians who have the power to do something and for some reason aren't yeah it's expensive there's a lack of yeah. political will maybe there's a lack of of public pressure here uh which is why i think conversations like this are so important we're talking a lot about uh the retrospective angle here what have we learned from covid19 what have we observed and how do we apply it to moving forward why don't we talk about what's going on right now uh yeah. how confident are you i mean i know for a fact that there are healthcare workers and i'm not talking specifically in long-term care there are healthcare workers that that refuse to get vaccinated there will be teachers yeah. in schools that will refuse to get vaccinated there will be people returning to workplaces that will not get vaccinated what's your position on mandatory vaccinations for long-term care workers? I've been very clear on this. I have said this in numerous interviews publicly on numerous broadcasts for months now that I absolutely think that we need to mandate vaccines, particularly in long-term care. I, I don't understand how we can allow the, the, frankly, you know, often social media inspired disinformation campaigns to dictate a public health crisis. Because barring medical exemptions, and I would never, obviously, we all understand medical exemptions, and that's completely understandable. But for the, you know, the conspiracy theorists and the anti-vaxxers that, you know, believe you, you'll have 5G if you get the vaccine or this kind of, I can't wrap my head around it nonsense. I mean, this is blatant misinformation and disinformation that is being spread. And unfortunately, because we're not doing, I don't know, a good enough job at provincial levels um, to really clarify that this is indeed misinformation. And we need to take a hard stance supporting science, then I don't know how, how we're ever going to get through this. I don't see an end right now because we know the fourth wave is coming when we go back to school. The second wave started when we went back to school last year and we all saw that coming. That was predicted to have happened. And, and the fourth wave will be predicted to happen when we go back in the fall, barring um, not mandating vaccines. Hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's been interesting. I mean, we've had this conversation several times in, in different contexts about you know how experts feel about things like vaccine passports or mandatory vaccinations. I shared just a personal story yesterday from my beer league hockey gathering, the weekly hockey gathering, where the guys voted and determined that if you're not double vaxxed, you're not skating with us. And it's caused it. it's well, and 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 I love it too. And I'm on the record as voting. Hell yeah. And unapologetically voting hell yeah. But it's causing some issues yeah. with friendships. And yeah. I think bigger picture, COVID, uh, through the course of this experience, unfortunately has driven a stake and, and created some distance between people and some personal relationships. And, and when it comes down to a matter of, quite frankly, life and death, so be it. Have you seen any positive developments? Are you encouraged by anything that you've seen over the past year and a half? Have any positive changes manifested themselves? You know, I tend to focus on what isn't being done, mm. but I, I've had some conversations with people that, you know, I work with in my advocacy informally, of course. Um, uh, and when, when I talk to them, these are, these are, you know, very other reputable advocacy organizations, you know, they'll remind me that one thing that is very obvious over the course of this pandemic is that we have never seen this much attention and advocacy to support long-term care. So that brings me hope. And I do think when you look at the public polls that have indeed occurred, the overwhelming majority of Canadians not only want long-term care to fall under the Canada Health Act and be treated like hospitals, 86%, but then the vast majority, and we're in the 90s now, are terrified 
of entering long-term care. People saw what happened. People are overwhelmingly disgusted. I really do think that this is a problem at the top. I think that this is politicians who are not courageous enough uh, for whatever reasons to do the right thing and to implement the kinds of changes that we need to really model long-term care like acute care. Make it as similar as possible because there's no question that the outbreaks that we saw in long-term care were largely preventable um, and certainly in the second wave and had to do with, as you said, um, relying on these temporary workforces to go to multiple homes instead of just hiring full-time, stable, permanent employees in these homes, which makes sense for so many reasons, not least of which that you actually have continuity of care. You get to know your residents. You get to know who, you know, what their needs are, what they, you know, you get to know their families. That is a win for everyone, the staff, the residents, the families. When you constantly have new workers in because of the revolving door who don't know the, the residents, then what do you expect is going to happen? Injuries happen, preventable injuries, medical neglect and, and death. And that's exactly what we've seen over the past, you know, certainly during COVID and, and well, clearly throughout. Um, but it's a big problem. So we, in my idea, I think it's a no brainer here. You need to model this system as similarly as you can to acute care, to hospitals. And you're going to eradicate 90 percent of the problems. I just want to be crystal clear so I understand. So when, when you talk about modeling it after acute care, um, yeah. are, are, are you talking about, so for example, if, if I show up with an issue, uh, heaven forbid, and, and, and a person in my life has experienced a fall and we take them into the ER, you're talking about oversight oh, and no, triage. Sorry. What, what, what yeah, are you talking about? I'm talking about? about public nonprofit delivery. Okay. Public nonprofit delivery. And then you see the kinds of, you know, heavy union um, participation, which then leads to higher wages and training and better working conditions for these workers. Because as we've learned, probably the most important takeaway from long-term care and from one of my, you know, uh, research friends who I worked with under at York University, Dr. Pat Armstrong, who's easily the Canadian expert in long-term care, very succinctly puts it that the conditions of work become the conditions of care. So, and that's exactly what we saw happen, right? The homes that had the best outcomes during COVID being the municipal homes, were very much modeled like hospitals. They had full-time permanent workers who have continuity of care, been in these jobs for you know years, decades, who know the workers, paid well, good training opportunities, ongoing learning. This makes all the difference, right? All, and it did make all the difference. And what we saw was the homes that treated these, these <laughs> warehouses like McDonald's and had these temporary workforces just in and out, in and out, didn't matter about the training, you should hear the number of fraudulent certificates that I have seen, not only in ministry inspections, brought from families who are telling me that these workers, a lot of these workers, and I'm not blaming the workers, I'm blaming the agencies and the homes that hire them as a way to make money off them by devaluing their labor and paying them less, who have zero healthcare training, who have zero expertise in actually providing this very difficult care, right? This is structural. I definitely am not blaming the workers. I am completely in support of not exploiting them which in my opinion is what is happening right now in predominantly the for-profit sector. I'm not trying to spray gasoline on something that's already burning. Uh, you, you've, you've talked about ageism and you've mentioned yeah. it. You've also alluded or pointed out to the fact that many of the frontline staff here, uh, what did you call oh, them? Yeah. The P, PCWs or something? PSW, PSWs, personal support workers personal or support care aides in Quebec. Many yeah. of them, you say it's, it's disproportionately women. It's disproportionately racialized yeah. women. Yeah. Do you think there's an element of racism at play here? I've said this in numerous interviews from the very beginning. This is not only the trifecta. We're not a quadrant here. This is the amalgam of sexism, racism, ableism, and ageism. Because keep in mind, the majority of long-term care residents are women, and they're older women, majority of which have disabilities. So you're seeing the you know, cumulative disadvantage accumulate here. But then on top of it, you have a majority racialized female worker population, many of which are new to Canada. And then that's, that adds a whole different layer when you are starting to exploit migrant workforces, which has happened uh, to a whole new level during COVID. And there's multiple star exposés which have revealed this. It's actually horrifying. I, I will send those links to you. Um, you know, this is what happens, right? So... It's the amalgam, sexism, racism, ableism, ageism. I feel like you've given us marching orders. This is great. I mean, this, this should, no, but really, this should, I mean, it should, I, I'm not trying to be a fear monger as part of our job, you know, as, as part you of what we be do. Scared. But I, of course, 
I mean, and you, you start talking, I feel like you're the person, you know, you're up on that crow's nest on the Titanic, and, and but you're seeing it. Like you're you're going in six hours, we're going to hit this thing. We've got plenty of time to adjust course. And you're talking about the implications for millennials. We talk about an aging population. We take a look at right. I mean, all of these factors at play, and ultimately, this is something that impacts everybody in one way, shape, or form. And it demands a bigger national conversation. I'm grateful that you have driven. Uh, much of those, I should mention your your day of action. Uh, you held that, or yeah. you 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 co organized this national day of protest back at the end of April. Yeah. Did you did you feel empowered, encouraged, discouraged? How did you feel yeah. after that? Always empowered after these events because you see, I mean, it was trending number one on Twitter. Not that that's a yeah. marker of anything, but I of mean, it, it shows you that people were listening, people are paying attention. Whenever we have these events, whenever we connect with the community, we see how people really do show up. So that's why I have the faith that it's not that this is, you know, people ignoring this at a community level. I really do think the problem is at the top here and we just don't have the political will to do what is right. And we just have to keep putting that pressure on because every time I, you know, interact with the community, um, the workers, the residents, the families, I mean, it's, it's, it's scary. They need change. They deserve change. They have been through hell, hell, true hell. And we can't keep we can't keep on this way. We can't. Dr. Vivian Stamatopoulos, uh, an associate teaching prof at Ontario Tech University. You can give her a follow on Twitter. I almost demand that you do at Dr. <laughs> Vivian S. Thanks for giving us your time. This I, I just have a, a, a ton of respect uh, for people driven by not just the passion. That's very evident, but also just your, your background information and the way that you articulate it, uh, making issues that sometimes I think can get a little bit murky for people, making it understandable nailing down the key points and giving us stuff to demand from our own different levels of government. Thank you for this. Thank you very much. You bet. Dr. Vivian Stamatopoulos. Wow. You know, I saw a comment here uh, a while back in our, in our live chat, just on fire right now, which I absolutely love. And, uh, you know, this is someone said, you know, what I don't love about these types of conversations is is that it implies i'm trying to find where the comment is so i can credit the the audience member but basically say this is the type of thing where you know it it implies that all private care centers are horrific you know and that's not the case this is this is kind of the the equivalent of of the not all care homes that argument there and this is where i might and maybe this is hardwired in people people have different feelings on different methods of healthcare delivery or how healthcare can be delivered. And and I know that this may anger some people, but I guarantee you there are many people that will hear this interview that'll say, listen, we need to have way higher standards in long-term care. We need to ensure that staff are better paid. There needs to be better oversight. That was a powerful quote from Vivian, wasn't it? Conditions of work become or equal conditions of care. And, and that seems to be self-evident and obvious, but maybe not. It's something we need to focus on. But you'll probably have many people listening to that interview saying, I 100% and absolutely and completely support a robust, uh, healthy, well-funded, adequately overseen public long-term care delivery. But for me or for my family, we want to choose. We don't want to be assigned a public long-term care bed. We want to have the option of a private facility. And this is a way bigger conversation, right? If I want to make this a huge conversation and really, you know, imagine the drone at the opening of the movie when it starts to zoom out, zoom out, zoom out, zoom out and get really wide. These are the same types of arguments you'd have around private surgical facilities, private schools, And what do we always get not hung up on, but what are some of the important or key talking points, whether you're talking about private surgery, private long-term care, private schools? A lot of times people will say they should not be publicly funded, number one. You know, for example, in our home province of Alberta, for reference, if you send your kids to a private school, that private school will receive approximately 70% of the funding that a public school would receive if your kid went there. And then it's up to the private school by way of tuition or fundraising or whatever else to raise the rest. In other provinces or other jurisdictions where private schools exist, they receive zero government funds and it's up to the families or the fundraisers or whatever to raise all of the operating costs for the school. And some people will say, well, that's more palatable. We can't stomach or we don't love the idea that public funds, albeit 70% of them, 
are going to a private school. The funding should stay in the public system because the fewer and fewer investments you make in a public system, the weaker the public system becomes, thereby justifying private delivery. I'm a graduate of private schools. I've attended public schools. I can see both sides of the coin, and I'm happy to have those conversations. I'm interested to know where our audience will land on the assertion that there should not be, or let me rephrase, that all long-term care delivery should be public. I think you can make a pretty compelling argument. I mean, she talked about unions. I know that that will, and I don't use the word in a, in a defamatory, it will trigger some people. Just the word, just the mere mention of a union will trigger some people. I love that I'm talking about this right leading up to Dr. Joe Vipon next. He's probably going to blow a gasket as soon as I check in with him. I love it. If anyone, would, Dr. Joe will dig in on this. He'll have no problem, I'm sure. But I'm curious to know where the audience is going to land on this and how you feel about it. We plant these seeds, we water them, and then we check our inbox. If you'd like to comment on what you've just heard, you can send us an email anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Crystal was watching that interview. She says, Dr. Vivian is how I feel on the inside, on the outside. (laughs) That's a great compliment. Edmonton Chump says we should take long-term care away from government, have them be run by boards made up of people with families that are being cared for in the facility. Others say this this is Mizuno Pearl. These politicians retire rich. They never worry about retiring poor. They never worry about requiring long-term care. They're going to be able to pay somebody to take care of them. Paula says everybody needs to be accountable here. Governments need to step up. Saw a ton of people here leaving comments on steps that they are taking, whether it's renovating their basement or or moving into a duplex where the other side of the home can be their parents. Or I'm always curious to know how people manage that responsibility, the honor and the responsibility. There are cultural implications too, right? In some cultures, it's 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 almost widely it's expected, not accepted. It's expected that different generations of family will live together and will care for one another. It's, it's much more normal in some cultures or much more common than in others. Like Michelle says, my mom suggested buying both sides of a duplex, one for her, one side for my mother-in-law. It's kind of a neat solution. I thought it was interesting, though, that the doctor mentioned, you know, that it, it is safety. We have to also consider safety. It can be dangerous um, once someone's physical or mental status um, deteriorates to a certain point it is very dangerous and it's if it is downloaded onto the family member um, it's at what cost well and can we talk about the stress of that exactly right so safety stress i mean if you're yeah if you're you know if, if if grandpa is experiencing you know you know some sort of issues with balance for example and you're you're at your job and you were there this morning making sure that he took his meds and got his breakfast and you're going to be there again at lunch and you're going to be there again in the evening. But in the meantime, you hope he's not climbing the stairs. Yeah, that's a really tough position for a family to be in. But for a lot of families, it's not an option for a lot of families. That's the way it's got to be. Also, Karen. also, sorry to interrupt. I'm um, just thinking around uh, the expectation of that a family member is going to step in. Just I'm going to have kids, so I have a caregiver. Yeah, that is not that is not guaranteed. And she folks. touched on that, didn't she? Yeah. I mean, she talked. It was interesting to get her take on on how you know, what I mean, the evolution of of women in the workplace, for example, has had a great impact on the conversation about long term care in Canada. I mean, I felt like we could have kept Vivian for about four hours. I would be that would just be a fun experiment to see if she could maintain that level of enthusiasm. I think she probably could. I mean, that is an advocate right there. That is somebody that is, you know, you almost as an interviewer just go, I'll, I'll just go. Just run. You know what people need to know. Just run with it. Talk at RyanJesperson.com is where you can be in touch with us. And, and we appreciate all of the emails that we receive. We wanted to remind you that coming up later this month, as, as a matter of fact, it's coming up in like two weeks. Two weeks tomorrow, the World Triathlon Championship Finals. The city of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada will play host. This is a huge event when it comes to triathlon around the world these are literally the fittest athletes on the planet i'm i'm open to discussion on that but i don't know who's who's going to argue ahead of maybe decathletes do you think there's a rivalry 
Didn't Canada take gold in decathlon today? Yeah, just this morning. Is there is is there a rivalry between triathletes and decathletes? I wonder. What a fun roundtable that would be. <laughs> just get them on. Just start trashing each other. Tell you who's more fit. We could put them all on treadmills. They could do the whole roundtable on a treadmill. And we just keep making it go faster and faster. But then you got to get them swimming and biking. And, and then the decathlete, they'd, they'd be like, well, when's the pole vault? Right? Well, precisely, yeah. When's the pole vault? Triathlon to me is like, I, I look at triathletes and I'm just like, I, I, I think of Wayne's world. Like, Wayne and Garth in front of Alice Cooper. We're not, We're worthy. not worthy. We're I'm not, not worthy. worthy. I might be showing up on August 21st for the, for the big races, the elite races, just to deliver the we're not worthies. I'll be the guy. I'll be the fan that's delivering the we're not worthies. If you want to be there and do the same thing, they've set up a booking system. Organizers have. They want to ensure, obviously, safety and distancing, but it's free to attend, and you can get your seats in the prime viewing area and register. I mean, there's competition opportunities, volunteer opportunities. The home for all of this is edmonton.triathlon.org. Edmonton.triathlon.org. We also want to remind you that our friends at Athabasca University are getting set to welcome back learners this fall as Canada's online university. Their world-class accredited online programs and courses offer you the flexibility to learn at your own pace on a schedule that suits your life style. I mean, I think it's fair to say that as Canadians, people around the world, quite frankly, have have recognized the value, the convenience of on-demand online learning through the course of this pandemic. Athabasca U has been doing it and doing it best for years. If you check out athabascau.ca, you can learn more about how it all works and browse their programs and courses. All right, I just want to roll in hot to uh, Dr. Joe Vipond. Um, we appreciate uh, Dr. Lenora Saxinger being in touch with us. She's trying to track down Wi-Fi. She's literally, she's like on a, she's on a trip with her family on a farm, and she's been trying to find Wi-Fi. We appreciate her efforts. We're going to try to get her on today. If it doesn't work, we're going to try our best to talk to her tomorrow. Dr. Joe Vipond is an emergency physician practicing at the Foothills Medical Center in Calgary, and he's he's been a huge part of organizing these daily protests you've seen them uh, for a number of days now growing in prominence in calgary at the mcdougall center and in edmonton uh at the legislature ground stock welcome back to the show it's good to have you here yeah it's great to be on and i have to do my my regular uh qualifier that these are my views and not those of Alberta Health Services or the University of, of uh, Calgary. And I'd also like to say I'm actually at the Rocky view now. I'm 100% oh. community medicine, community merge, which uh, I really love. Did, was that a recent move for you? About a year ago, mm-hmm. yeah. I, uh, you know, over the last few years, I've been doing more meeting with politicians, more media interviews. The Foothills Medical Center is an amazing place, but it's pretty stressful, right? Like it's all trauma, complicated oncology patients and, um, yeah, I just felt a little need for simplicity, you know? Hmm. I don't know why. I mean, well, I know exactly why. The, the, the Even the mere mention of the Rocky View, my heart kind of swelled when you said that. My dad, I used to accompany him. He was a physician in Calgary for more than 40 years. And uh, obviously, I'd never go into the rooms with him. But when he made his rounds at the Rocky View, I'd come with him oftentimes in the late afternoon or the evenings. And I'd, I'd hang out at the nurse's station. They always made me feel so welcome. And I feel, uh, to me, just, just based on watching dad work and practice what he loved so dearly for for many decades that's that's almost like sacred ground to me at the rocky yeah it's a fabulous place you know fabulous people great location biking home uh, by the reservoir there uh, amazing yeah hey uh but before we go any further sometimes uh interviews kind of blend into one another and i was talking to dr vivian stamatopoulos who's a fierce advocate for long-term care and and she was she basically has kind of a, a non-starter type perspective on on long-term care in Canada. She believes it should be publicly delivered. She does not, but she believes that for-profit long-term care centers were, uh, I mean, easily pinnable when it comes to a lot of the what she describes as preventable deaths through the course of the pandemic. I broadened the conversation as I waxed poetic for a couple of moments talking about private versus public delivery. Do you have, is, is this, I mean, this is not what you're here to talk about. You're here to talk about COVID restrictions, but I got a doctor here and I know you're outspoken and I know you're not afraid to share your opinions. Is there room in your mind for a, a coexistence of different styles, methods, or structures of healthcare delivery, so long as public systems are funded to an adequate and healthy degree, or is it a non-starter for you? I mean, I'm not an expert on this, so I defer to to, to Dr. Um, Vivian. Um, but 
I and I, I wish I could pronounce your last name, but I know Stamatopoulos. I, I yeah, if I was going to try, um, and, and that's a, a a thing of respect because I know that uh, often female doctors don't don't get given the same titles um, sometimes. Mm-hmm. So I just want to acknowledge that. But um, I think the reality. I, I mean, I know math, right? Like, so I don't know private versus public health care, but the math that I understand is if you want to provide the, um, if you want to deliver, say you have $100 to deliver care in the public system, and all of that goes to care, um, that $100 in the private system also has to go to profit. So you can't, it's all, the, the math almost dictates that you can't give the same thing, um, because for, uh, you know, some of that money has to go to profit. So especially if it's publicly funded, privately delivered, something's got to be cut. Yeah. And, and that's the reality. And, and that's, a, and, and you rightfully uh, point out that that if it's publicly funded, privately delivered, then something's got to give. I uh, agree with you 100 percent there. Uh, in in my mind, I kind of look at it like t- just as a crude and lazy example. You know, if a knee surgery, uh, somebody at a public s- surgical facility is going to cost seven thousand uh, dollars. You know, I say in the private system, if somebody wants to pay 20 and if you tax them and if a privately funded knee replacement funds a publicly funded knee replacement as well and clears up a spot in the queue, then I've got all the time in the world to listen to it. I know that advocates for public Public health would look at me and say, you are grossly oversimplifying this. That's not how it works. You're not doing a service to the conversation. I just wanted to pick your brain on that. But let's get to the brass tacks of why you're here. Let's get to the protests. Let's get to why people are demanding protect our province, why hundreds of people are showing up day after day after day in Calgary and Edmonton. I mean, what's the gist of it for people that are tuning in from Ontario or Newfoundland or B.C. right now? Well, I think I think. Um, we're all scared, right? Like the, I don't know if you saw the non-apology apology yesterday where she was saying that, you know, I apologize for the style of communication that's made people angry and upset and, and frightened. Um, but we're not actually upset by the way it was communicated. We're upset by the policy. So let's be very clear. It's the policies that are worrisome, not Dr. Hinshaw's method of delivering the, the information on that. Um, the policies that have been announced have two consequences, and I think it's really important to understand those consequences. The first one is that it's going to allow uh, exponential growth, rampant growth throughout those people that are unvaccinated. And that are some people that have chosen to be unvaccinated. Um, but let's be clear, we gave them that choice. We as a society have said you can choose to decide, uh, to, to decide whether or not you want to be vaccinated or not. And, and then there's a whole 670,000 children under the age of 12 that do not even have that choice. So it's going to go run through both of those populations. Um, and uh, even amongst those that are unvaccinated, I, f- I feel like there's a little bit of, well, they deserve it then going on. Even amongst the tweets that are coming out from Dr. Hinshaw, there was one tweet that's where she said, uh, you know, a lot of 20 to 29 year old people you think you're protected but you're not there's lots of people being hospitalized and going to the ICU so damn it you better go get um, uh, vaccinated and I think the subtext was because we're unleashing this on you <laughs> you know like it's it sounded like a threat to me um, which I, I makes me really nervous that kind of tone the ethics of that um, so that's the first thing we're, we're unleashing it it's going to be exponential growth a substantial number of our unvaccinated people are going to get s- sick um, going to get infected, going to get sick. Some will be hospitalized. Some will go to the ICU, and some will die. Uh, and that includes our our our, our very young. Um, the second consequence to this policy is that we're hiding the numbers. So, in the midst of our fourth wave, and let's be very clear, we are in the fourth wave right now. Some people call it the stampede wave or the rodeo wave, um, but. Uh, but we already have exponential growth. We've stopped doing testing on asymptomatic contacts. So say, you know, somebody tests positive, they reach out to all the people that they've been in contact with. And those people, a certain number of them will go get tested just to make sure they don't, don't have asymptomatic disease. We've stopped that. Um, and, and then we're going to go on to only be testing those people um, who are going to be uh, uh, visiting the hospital. Um, so, you know, it's going to be very hard for Albertans to understand 
what's happening on the ground as far as uh, where the outbreaks are, which communities are affected. Um, and, uh, and, and so by taking that information away from us, uh, it, it takes away the information citizens need to protect themselves. And I think that's profoundly a- uh, anti-democratic. Um, you know, we gather together as a society, Ryan, to, because some, in some cases, a collective action is much more functional than libertarianism. Like it, it's great to be a libertarian farmer and do your own farming, but when it comes to getting sick or building roads or public health, we need to work together on these things. And there, there, there's no alternative to um, good policy when it comes to public health. It's interesting. I mean, you, you, you even mentioned the word libertarianism and it, and it alludes, I mean, you allude to the fact that so much of this has been politicized. I mean, I, I saw just the other day, one of the premier's staff is pushing out public records of political parties to whom you have personally donated uh, over the past number of years, right, to, to Alberta's provincial NDP. What's that, been, what's that been like for you to have, I mean, you're a physician, you're advocating for public health policy, you've got the premier's staffers coming at you for your political affiliations or your political donations. I mean, at some point, people are going to go, is any of this conversation really about public health? I mean, how much of this is about the politics of everything? Right. And and uh, I think it's interesting that with over 10,000 tweets that I've made over the last, you know, five years of being on Twitter, all my public appearances, that the most they can get on me is that I donated to a political party. Um, you know, that's part of the democratic process. Uh, I'm quite proud that I'm engaged in the democratic process by, so uh, you know, putting forward uh, financial support during elections. Some of the uh, the, the wording coming from the right wing about those donations is that I'm a shill mm. for the NDP. I think it should be very clear. I have no affiliation with the NDP. Donating to a political party is very normal. I think it's a lot of people donate to political parties. And if I was a shill, you know, I want to get some of that money. I, donating money doesn't make me a shill. If I was getting money, then... For, for sure, that that title uh, I, I would wear, but I, I'm not. <laughs> this is all volunteer, man. I'm I'm here in my own time um, because I, I really love this province and I'm really scared at the direction it's going in. Has it been worth it for you? I mean, it's it's got to be an itch to, to find yourself in the crosshairs of the premier or his team or his staff or to find your name. I mean, you've you've risen to prominence, really across the province right now what sort of an impact has that like we should reiterate to people you still practice medicine you still have a day job right this is your advocacy i mean did you did you kind of find yourself somewhat swept up in all of this or did you see this coming and were you prepared to take the mantle on no this is a conscious decision um when the uh when the announcement occurred last wednesday um i think like all people uh, i was quite overwhelmed kind of a combination of fear and incredulity that the fear that, Oh my God, I know what's coming down the, the pipe and this incredulity that, Oh my God, our, our, our institutions are failing us. Um, I don't know how many other people had that sense. I, I, I created a metaphor. Like when you're a little kid and you think all adults are awesome and your parents never make mistakes and they're the best. And then as you grow up, you start to realize that your parents do make mistakes and not all adults have your best interests at heart. And, and that feeling we're like, like almost like a trap door of, of, of free falling because, oh my, oh my gosh, all the things that I thought um, were there to protect me are, 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 are not as stable as I thought. And I, I felt, felt that way about our institutions, right? If our public health is no longer about the health of the public, um, it's about politics. It's about um actively infecting uh, Albertans with a, a, a disease that can have deadly consequences. And and let's be clear, long-term disability associated with that, um, that really affected me. So I had to make some choices. I actually had a tearful interview on one of the, the TV stations because it was like a half hour interview and they, they clipped like the 10 seconds where I broke down where I was like, you know, I, I have to do something. Um, I don't want to do this because I, you know, I'd rather just binge watch Netflix and hang out with my kids. Um, but but I think I have this maladaptive trait that if I'm feeling threatened, um, if if I see injustice, uh, I, I need to go up and, and, and try and change that. Um, uh, you know, it's probably better than 
like over drinking or um, mm -hmm. like visiting prostitutes, but um, it's it's still it's still a coping mechanism, right? That I have, um, and uh, fortunately, uh, sometimes it, it works. And and you know, I've I've been um, a rather successful advocate uh, to this point, and I don't tend to take on advocacy roles where I don't think I'm going to win um, because I, you know it's fun winning. Um, Maybe fun's not the right term, but it's uh, empowering to win. What would you characterize as a win here? Um, well, I mean, we, we've already seen some hints that, that, that we're winning. Uh, last night, uh, there was an article in the Globe and Mail saying that uh, Dr. Patty Hyju, the Minister of Health, has said that um, this is an overstep. Uh, by the the government, uh, in or maybe an understep, like an this this is not appropriate public health behavior. And if you guys won't do the job, um, we'll we'll have to step in. So I I already see hints um, that we are reversing some of this. I think the fact that you have um, Premier Kenny and uh, Minister Shandro throwing uh, Dr. Hinshaw under the bus. Um, uh, the damage control that Dr. Uh, Hinshaw is out there doing today with, you know, multiple radio interviews, um, the, the, the non-apology apology that came out, these are all evidence that the government's on its back foot and trying to defend itself. So um, we have taken upon ourselves to, to do these uh, rallies every day. Today is going to be day seven. Uh, it starts in about two hours. So if you're in Calgary or Edmonton or Red Deer, um, please come out to our rallies. Um, and, and we'll just keep rallying until we have a full reversal of this and, and uh, evidence that public health is, is again, going to be for the, the health of the public. Really? Like you're so, actually, you, you will be there every single, there's no end date in sight. You're not going to the end of the week or you're not going to August 15th or something like that. Well, we, we, we have until August 16th to reverse this. So that's the, the near term goal. Um, you know, I, I've also been clear that I think that um, this government's lost the moral authority to govern. Um, you know, if, if you're willing to infect, um, you know, more than a million Albertans with a deadly disease where a certain, you know, 10 to 30 percent of adults and, you know, somewhere between three to 13 percent of kids get a long term disability um, from even asymptomatic or, or, or mildly symptomatic disease, uh, you've lost the moral authority to govern. Um, you know, Minister Shandro uh, over and over again um, has has proven that he's he's not adequate as a. Uh, uh, Minister of Health, you know, he's got 98% of doctors voted a year ago to say that they had no faith in his leadership. And Dr. Hinshaw has also clearly, um, <laughs> I was thinking about this today, you know, those like Twitter memes or internet memes where it's like you had one job, <laughs> you know, like this school written wrong on the, on the, on the pavement because of C, uh, S H C O O L and like, and you had one job, come on guys. Well, Dr. Hinshaw, you had one job, like just protect Albertans, like simple public health measures. And yet we're embarking on this experiment, the first jurisdiction in the world at the beginning of a fourth wave where we have ongoing exponential growth. Um, it's profoundly disturbing that she feels that this is an adequate response. Um, I... I don't know what to say. Like, you know, like, we've heard Joe, we've heard from some physicians like one of them um, who's asked to remain anonymous, which is fine. But they've sent us an email from their uh, official account. I mean, we can verify that this is a, a physician with credentials in the province says, you know, I, I don't think that people realize that this is legitimate public health strategy that is under juris that is under discussion in many jurisdictions. And 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 public health professionals across Canada range in opinion from being fully supportive to non-supportive. There are some concerns around timing, the Delta variant and surveillance. And of course, the communications around it has been truly poor. And there's more pushback in Alberta from citizens than in some other places. But it is a legitimate strategy. What would you say to people like that? Where in the world is this being done? If this is such a great strategy, where has it been done? But the it's premier, you know, Joe, the premier would say back to you, yeah, no, we are the first. And he would talk about freedom and liberty and patriots. And he would use all these words and people would start screaming and cheering hurrah because we would be first. But that doesn't mean it's ill. I mean, I'm devil's advocate here, but it doesn't mean it's illegitimate just because we're first. 
right? It goes down to risk, right, Ryan? I mean, I said this at the begin uh, in June when when they announced that there was going to be a stampede in the elimination of pretty much every public health measure at the beginning of July, um, and people said, "Are we going to have a fourth wave, Joe?" And I said, "You know, I don't know, but I know this is super risky." And so, why is it risky? It's because um, you know we know that this disease has exponential growth, and we know we are losing all of our public health efforts. Um, and, and so even if there's high levels, and let's be clear, we have the lowest levels of vaccination in the, in the, in the country as far as provinces go, um, th- this is, was a super high-risk policy. And, you know, I, I don't want to spec, I do want to speculate on motives, but let's be clear that I'm speculating on motives. So it, it seemed that the government, uh, you know, Premier Kennedy, uh, Kenny was in quite a bit of trouble um, you know, his ratings are the lowest uh, uh, in the country. Um, and it, it he promised us a good stampede and the best summer ever. And it became clear over the last three weeks that that wasn't going to happen. Right. So uh, this was not a flawless stampede. We've had, you know, quite a bit of transmission in Calgary, especially amongst our 20 to 29 year olds. It seems very much related to the stampede. And now we're well on the way through a fourth wave. Um, and at the same, uh, so, so now we're going forward at the beginning of this fourth wave and we're taking off, um, uh, we're, we're turning off all of our, our visual systems. So we're no longer going to be able to see where the, 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 um, COVID is, is being transmitted, which communities, which high schools, which institutions have outbreaks. And at the same time, we're removing every single possible COVID uh, plan so that we can protect Albertans against ankle sprains and syphilis. Uh, so, I mean, is this really rational? Like who, I like to know who these doctors are because I, I, I don't know anybody publicly saying this is a great idea. Um, I'm worried that this is based on something called the Great Barrington Declaration. Uh, Ryan, have you heard of that before? Yeah, I mean, it's been widely debunked, but why don't you bring our audience up to speed? Okay, so this was a, a, a think tank out of the Northeast United States. I can't remember the exact name of the think tank, but it was funded by the Cox brothers, who are, are well-known libertarian um, funders. Um, actually, Cox brother, because one of them has passed away. Mm. Um, and the idea is, is that if we let it rip through society amongst our least vulnerable and we protect our most vulnerable, um, then we'll get herd immunity quicker and um, we, we won't have the consequences are on, on our economy. Um, I, I think I would argue that Sweden tried that. They had the highest rate of mortality in the Nordic countries by far. The UK seems to be trying it now, um, and we're doing it even more so. Ryan, which jurisdiction in the world has achieved herd immunity? I don't do well on pop quizzes. No, nobody has, right? There's not a single country in the world that's like, we have achieved herd immunity. So we're, we're racing for a goal that we don't even know is achievable. The closest uh, um, like idea behind herd immunity has been a, a, a city called Manaus in the in the, in Brazil. In Brazil, yeah. They were destroyed by the first wave in Brazil, and there were like serology tests, like where people go and donate blood. Um, Eighty to ninety percent of those blood donations uh, had antibodies towards COVID, and so people are like, "Wow, they've achieved herd immunity! Great!" And then. The P1 uh, gamma wave hit Manaus and devastated it even more. Um, so that idea that the natural immunity from the first wave uh, didn't pan out. So, you, you know, I, I'm hearing from, from parents that are scared. I'm hearing from healthcare workers that are scared. Um, I don't think we've thought through some of the unintended consequences of this, which how is this going to help our economy if people don't know what's happening on the ground, can't make good decisions? Who's going to go to the theater when they don't know if the person with the sniffly nose beside them has COVID and, of course, is not wearing a mask? Who's, which teacher is going to want to teach 
in a classroom of elementary school kids when they're worried that, um, you know, that the children might give them COVID because there are breakthrough infections, even if they're double vaxxed, and then they'll take that home to their family. Or alternatively, they give COVID to their children and the profound moral um, indignity uh, or the, the moral inquietude that, that comes from being the person that's infecting their students. Um, which healthcare worker is going to feel comfortable working in a system where they're treating uh, exponential growth of young people, and this will be the young person's a wave, um, young people with, with COVID um, that is, you know, preventable. Uh, and, and going back to the healthcare workers uh, at, you know, you, you and your listeners well know that this is a federation, right? We, we don't have um, walls around our, our borders. Um, healthcare workers, if given the choice between working in a system where they feel moral discomfort, um, feel um, disrespected by the government, then just move away. And Pre- we're seeing this already. Pre- Premier says they won't do it, Joe. Premier says they're not going to move somewhere else to pay higher taxes. He says he doesn't see it happening. He's on the record. That was two weeks ago. Yeah, well, you know what? The, the premier is very focused on money, right? Like he he actually feels that most people's values are centered around monetary gain. And that's not what I see. I see people who, you know, value safety, who value um, living in a society that, that cares for each other, Um and, and I, I, I know of many physicians who've left this province because even though we have some of the highest compensation rates in, in, the, in the country, um, are uncomfortable working under these conditions. And, and let's be very clear that this isn't Premier Kenny's province, right? This is, this is my province. This is Albertans' province. And so, um, you know... I can we talk about democracy for a sec? I've been thinking a lot about democracy. We can talk about whatever you want, Doc. Um, so, you know, we live in a representative democracy. And what that means is that every four years, um, because most citizens don't have the time or energy or inclination to learn everything about every policy, um, uh, uh, instead of direct democracy, where we vote on every issue, we, we elect a representative to go to the legislature, to parliament, to city hall, to, to represent us. And, and they're supposed to um, understand all the nuances of policy and then vote in our interest. That's what they represent us. Um, so two and a half years ago, we had an election where um, the United Conservative Party under, under Jason Kenney got a majority. And they've decided to govern as if that election has given them authority to do whatever they want. But that's really not how democracy works, right? They are still there to represent us as Albertans and our views. So um, right now, I think all of Alberta, you know, we've had, there have been multiple incidents like parks and coal where Albertans have said, you know, that's not, we're not comfortable with that. And, and thank God the UCP has reversed course on that. Um, but this is the loudest that Albertans have been, right? You know, we're in the nightly news every single day. Um, when was the last time you saw seven days in a row of 500 plus people marching in, in two cities, right? Like um, maybe a little bit lower in Edmonton, but, but certainly here in Calgary, it's been those kind of numbers. And we continue to, to do so and attract people. And, and we've had municipal politicians speak on this and we've had um, provincial politicians attend. We've had, um, you know, uh, doctors and nurses and teachers and children speak. Um, And this is a a real first for this province, uh, I would argue. And so as part of democracy, when our representatives are no longer representing us, it behooves citizens to step up and tell them that. And so I'm, I'm proud of Alberta for for doing that. And uh, I I hope we, I hope we win because I think, I honestly think, that uh, the path we're going down is very dark. If you want to, I mean, if you want to talk about democracy or if you want to talk about voting or if you want to talk about political strategy, I'll point out that it's way more problematic for Premier Kenny 
to have bigger protests in Calgary than Edmonton, right? The ones in Edmonton as a politician are easy to, as a conservative politician are easy to write off, right? Mm -hmm. You find a way to take a swipe at the whole city and you say, well, you can paint the city orange, like, you know, color me surprised. Tell, tell me something I didn't know. There's, there's, there's a whole bunch of NDPers in Edmonton or a bunch of Rachel Notley supporters are showing up at the legislature. The fact that you've got hundreds of people outside the McDougal center in Calgary, which is supposed to be the safe zone uh, for Premier Kenny and for the United Conservative Party, that's way more significant to me. I mean, I'm, I'm going to acknowledge that there are going to be Albertans in High Level and, and Grand Prairie and Lethbridge and Cardston and Airdrie and all across the province that are going to be concerned about this. I don't think this is a matter of Calgary versus Edmonton. I mean, these are people's voices that are coming together, and I'm certain that people are driving into the major metropolitan areas. Some people are probably driving a couple of hours every day to be at these protests because they feel so strongly about it. But the significance is not lost on me that as these protests continue to gain, uh, gain uh, prominence, in southern Alberta, that's got to be way more concerning to this premier. I'm not sure if you want to comment on that or not, but that's something I wouldn't ignore if you want to talk about the political side. Well, of this. If, you, if you want to keep riffing on democracy, let's let's talk about policy. And I think it's really funny that over the last uh, decade, I've I've started talking about policy like way too much, which is not not the usual uh, discussion topic for for emergency doctors, I'll say. Um, but you know, when you develop a policy, what you generally do is you develop it. You, you reference it, you engage stakeholders, uh, uh, and then, you know, stakeholders give feedback and then the policy is announced. None of that has happened with this, right? Um, you know, we keep hearing from Premier Kenny and Dr. Hinshaw that this is a policy based on evidence and science. Show us the evidence and the science. Like, that would be a, a, an amazing first step in helping Albertans to understand why these decisions have been made. What is the, the scientific underpinnings of these? Are they peer reviewed? What is the modeling that the government has done for what will occur as exponential growth continues amongst our unvaccinated? What number are they using for breakthrough infections? So how many double vax people are going to get COVID? Um, what are the hospitalizations rates that they're expecting in three weeks, four weeks, um, two months from now? How many schools are going to be impacted by this? Are they, uh, do they have any mitigation processes in, in schools? And, you know, we haven't even really talked about schools, but basically they've taken away all mitigation measures in schools. Um, so it, it, it honestly seems completely intentional to let it rip through our zero to 12 population because, you know, you gather, gather 30 people in a room. Um, we don't know what the ventilation is. You take off all their masks and you tell them to sit there for eight hours. And, and Susie in the corner with the sniffles isn't allowed to go get tested. Um, what, like, I know what the common sense outcome of that's going to be. It's going to be like, at least half of that class or, or more getting infected, right? Especially if she's Susie's there every day for five days a week. Um, so ha is, is this truly the intention of this policy? Um, what was the reason why they decided to stop reporting numbers? What, you know, what's, what's the scientific underpinnings of this? It's political this strategy. That's based, what it is. Sorry? It's political strategy. You take the power, they're telling you me take the numbers away from the people, you take the power away from the people. How is somebody like you or me going to step in front of a microphone and say, we are undeniably in a fourth wave if you don't have access to numbers? You can't really. Well, they're saying that they can they can monitor it through the wastewater system yeah. and through hospitalizations. And let's be clear that hospitalizations are a, a lagging indicator and wastewater only gives you a general sense as to what's going on. So that means, so, okay, we see the wastewater increasing here in Calgary. Um, where, where's that coming from? Is there an outbreak at Sir Winston Churchill school? How about the McDonald's on fourth street? Uh, how about the, the, the McDougal center downtown? Is there, is there an outbreak there? I don't know. What about in Balfe, Alberta? Uh, how does Calgary wastewater monitoring help us decide whether Balfe has like 20% infection rate? How does, uh, how does, uh, you know, Banff, uh, Alberta communicate to its tourism industry that, that they have, uh, you know, the highest rates in the, in, in the province? They, they wouldn't know. You know, we, we actually saw that happen four months ago. That, that information is being taken away from us. Um, and what are, you know, what's the scientific underpinnings of this? If they have some good scientific rationale for all of this, share it with us. Let us, let us 
evaluate it, debate it um, with that information. You take that information away. Uh, how are we as scientists, as citizens, uh, as medical professionals supposed to say uh, s- support or not support this? Uh, you know, we're, we're basically then just arguing, you know, some people have an opinion on this and some people don't have it, like have a different opinion on this, but, but not based on any like rational discourse. Joe, let me ask you uh, something. Crazy? I, no, I, I uh, certainly not. I, uh, I'm a big fan of the podcast, The Strategist. Uh, Corey Hogan mm. is one of the commentators. They're very sharp guy. Uh, yeah. And he, he was arguing on one of their mo- most recent episodes. And I'm, I, I want you to fact check this or give me your opinion on this as a physician. Um, he says that with a largely vaccinated population or as the population becomes more vaccinated, uh, case counts become less relevant and hospitalizations and ICU admissions become more relevant. Do you agree or disagree? And can you explain why? Delta is a different beast, right? Like Delta is not the original variant. So the original variant, there's some really interesting graphs that have been developed where if you look at vaccine eff- effectiveness and you look at percentage of population, and you look at um, NPIs, which are non-pharmacological interventions or, or basically mitigation measures, what do you need in order to get the RT, the, the real-time transmission below one? And so this is getting pretty scientific, but let me just break down some of that stuff. So RT more than one, exponential growth. RT less than one, exponential decline. The vaccines... And, 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 and legal mitigation measures drop the native transmission rate of the virus um, by wedges, right? So, that, you know, a, a, a vaccine that's, so let's make up some numbers, 88% effective for, for Pfizer vaccine, if it's amongst 80% of the population, will drop that transmission rate by a certain amount, Okay. With Delta, because its native transmission rate is somewhere between six to eight, which means every person that gets it will transmit it to six to eight people, with a a vaccine effectiveness of 88%, you would need more than 100% of the population to get an RT or a real-time transmission rate below one. So it's actually mathematically impossible to have decreasing rates with Delta variant with the vaccines we currently have. And that's with 100% of the population vaccinated. Right now in Alberta, we have the lowest vaccination rates among provinces in Canada, and it's just over 55% of Albertans that are fully vaccinated. 55% and somewhere around 65, I think, for the first vaccine. And we know that that's not particularly effective, about 33% for Pfizer. So this is a profoundly susceptible population, right? Like we have, you know, well over a million people that aren't vaccinated at all, including 670,000 children who can't get vaccinated. And over 2 million, um, or around 2 million, let's just say around 2 million, that don't have adequate protection either because they haven't been vaccinated or haven't been, you know, two, two vaccines plus two weeks. Um, is this really scientifically plausible that we are not going to have rampant exponential growth through our population with these measures and that nobody will know because they're not counting that the, the infected anymore. Like, um, again, Show us the money. If you think that this is scientifically evidenced, then let us know why I've got this wrong. Where is the calculation that I'm presenting here incorrect? Because I know I'm not an epidemiologist. I fully acknowledge I, I, don't, I don't have a public health degree. Um, but that is, you know, in my reading of the literature, and I try and keep up on this stuff, that is my understanding. And let's, let's be honest, Ryan, you know, masks aren't that bad. You know, a lot of people are, are quite used to wearing a mask. Um, and kids, you know, kids will go from inside the school wearing their mask. As teachers have told me this, uh, they're more likely to forget to put on their shoes than to take off their mask 
um, when it comes to to like leaving for recess, right? Um, it's 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 not that it's it's not that big an ask. It's not. Um, and I, I don't I don't I don't understand. I think I think the the kids and young people have been some of the most brave. Uh, people that, that that we've seen through this pandemic. I'm so proud. I mean, I, we watched online as our little guy graduated kindergarten and there are all these kids just wearing their masks, having their kindergarten graduation, trying to have some normalcy, their teacher. Amazing. There were also like five or six kids in the class that didn't have masks. I was like, what the fuck is that all about? You find out, well, they don't have to, their parents, th- these kids, parents, I'm sitting there. Are you kidding me? Yeah, and I'm not brave. trying to, I'm not trying to pick a fight with the, you know, fellow families in in the kindergarten class but that that drove me nuts quite frankly but i digress let's be clear they were brave in a situation where adults were protecting them over the last 16 months now we're throwing them under the treads of the tank you know we're we're actively the government is actively trying to infect all of them and again if that's not the intended consequence of this policy then the policy needs to be changed because that is what's going to happen joe let me be Uh, clear let me ask for clarity there because you you know that the politicians would roll their eyes and they would say really doctor you seriously think we're trying to actively infect the kids are you saying that you believe that this government is willingly and knowingly putting kids in harm way to try to advance that idea of herd immunity do you, you stand by the statement I would no. I cannot impugn motivation because the lawyers say I can't impugn motivation. But I would say that if you take away mandatory masking in schools, if you haven't done ventilation assessments of your schools, if you haven't told teachers to to open windows and open doors, if you allow exponential growth to occur amongst the population of people who can't even get the vaccine because it's not um, allowed by Health Canada, then the consequence of that will be that a substantial number of children will get this infection and a significant number of those, somewhere between 3 and 13%, we still don't know, will have long COVID, which is a long-term disability. And I would say if that is not the intention of this policy, then the policy needs to be revisited because that's going to be the consequence. Dr. Joe Vipon. Oh, by the way, uh, the Great Barrington Declaration uh, came out of the American Institute for Economic Research, the libertarian think tank. That's the reference we were uh, looking for earlier. We took you way into overtime. I'm really appreciative right. of your perspective and your willingness, your candor, uh, what you bring to the table. And uh much respect for your for your activism. I know that your intentions are pure, and I know a lot of people appreciate it. Last word. Yeah. Noon, McDougal Center. Noon, the legislature. Noon, it, uh, I believe it's Jason Stevens, the MLA in Red Deer's office. Um, please, we need all Albertans to say that this isn't acceptable. There you go. That's Dr. Joe Vipon. Thanks, Doc. We appreciate it. Out of the Rocky View Hospital in Calgary, Alberta. There you go. Uh, place has a special place in my heart, and, and we had to we had to find a hospital that that could hold, that could be representative of, of our affection for healthcare workers and our respect for the profession. Because my entire family, mom, dad, me, and three siblings, all born at the same hospital, the Holy Cross, which is one of them that was blown up. By, by an Alberta premier that managed to balance that, that managed to get Alberta to uh, out of the red. So so there you go. At what cost? People will ask. It was it worth it for King Ralph to make those decisions. But the Holy Cross was one of those that that fell on its sword. Uh, before we move on, some of you I know are probably wondering, what's up with the syphilis reference? I keep hearing people make syphilis references when it comes to Dr. Dina Hinch on her, her letter yesterday. Let me read from it. Quote, I care deeply about the health of all Albertans. This means I have to constantly consider not just COVID-19, but all other threats to people's health. The majority of our public health resources have been directed at the COVID-19 response, as has been necessary. That has come at the cost of not fully working on other threats like syphilis and opioid deaths. And she says it's time, in my opinion, as vaccine coverage has changed the nature of province wide risk to shift from province wide extraordinary measures to more targeted and local measures. And she goes on. The good news for me that comes out of all of this is an implication 
from Alberta's Chief Medical Officer of Health that the province is going to start sending more resources to address the opioid epidemic. And I look forward to seeing what that plan looks like. And don't tell me that it's a whole bunch of privately owned recovery centers. They do play detox centers, recovery centers, inpatient programs do play a role. But this is a government that has virtually pulled almost all funding in support for proven methods and facilities like supervised consumption services, of which I am a huge advocate. And if you want to see, you can search back through our show's history conversation, including with my brother. So I that to me, I'm going to take that as an indicator that Alberta's provincial government and chief medical officer of health are going to start getting serious about addressing Alberta's opioid epidemic. We are going to take a hard swerve in just a moment with Dr. John Roden, a bird expert. I mean, this is like has nothing to do with what we were just talking about, but this is a fascinating conversation on what human beings can do to cut back on the literally hundreds of millions of bird deaths each and every year due to building strikes. That coming up in just a moment. Wanted to remind you that our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park are stepping up in a big way through the month of August in support of the Wakutawin Society. This is a nonprofit that holds annual retreats for Indigenous women who are survivors of cancer and survivors of Indian residential schools. They provide access to retreats that are culturally safe for Indigenous women who are endeavor to heal their physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual being while empowering them to wellness and strength as community leaders for the entire month of August, $1 for every cone sold. At the Dairy Queens in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road will go to benefit the Wakutuin Society. We applaud our friends at the Dairy Queens in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. We also wanted to remind you that if you're living in the province of Alberta right now, or for that matter, anywhere in Canada where you've been running fans and air conditioning units and a whole bunch of other power draws, brace yourself for your next power bill. Our friends at Park Power want to remind you that expensive power bills present a great opportunity for you to start examining how you're spending your money and consider protecting yourself from price volatility. At parkpower.ca, you can learn more about their fixed rate offering, Park Power currently offering flexible fixed rates for electricity on one and three year terms. You're never locked in. You can switch your rates or cancel anytime at parkpower.ca. The promo code 2021 Real Talk gets you $70 off your first bill when you sign up. Also, wanted to remind you that our friends at Westworld Computers, in addition to powering our studio, are ready to help you with your sales or service needs. They have a fully authorized Apple service department. They're trained technicians, more than 40 years of experience, can upgrade or fix any Apple product. They've seen them all from your Mac, your iPad, your Apple Watch, even your iPhone. You can book your appointment for service today at westworld.ca or, of course, by calling the number on the screen. You can link to all of our Real Talk builders, our sponsors, under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Well, did you know that every year, literally, literally, hundreds of millions of birds... Birds in particular that are migrating north in the spring, south in the fall, die as they pass through big cities, building strikes, a huge contributor to these stunning numbers. Dr. John Rowden leads Audubon's bird-friendly community strategy, which works to provide birds with food, shelter, safe passage, and places to raise their young in the communities we share with them. He's a graduate in his PhD program in zoology out of Duke University. Doctor, we're thrilled to have you here with us this morning. Thanks for making time for us. Thanks, Ryan. It's a pleasure to be here. This is something that, that I don't think the average person thinks about. I mean, I know that some of us, I speak from firsthand experience, have had that gut-wrenching feeling when, when a beautiful bird smacks the window of your home, you feel terrible about it. You wish the bird a full recovery. It doesn't always happen, but when you actually evaluate it, nationally or internationally these are enormous numbers of casualties yeah absolutely and i think that that's a really interesting point that you brought up is that literally everyone has direct experience with this with that you know maybe once twice a year you have that um you hear that thud and you know something has happened but if you think about that taking those numbers across the entirety of north america the the numbers are staggering um you know estimates up to a billion uh, birds a year are killed by collisions um, in North America alone. And uh, 
there was a report that was released uh, about uh, a year and a half ago, which showed that over the past 50 years, we've lost 3 billion birds. Just the, the number of birds that exist in North America has declined by 3 billion in the past 50 years. And certainly these numbers of birds that are um, dying by collisions are contributing to that decline in birds across the continent. Do you have an estimate or an approximation of what percentage of the overall bird population that might represent? Uh, so it's it's about 30 percent, actually, of the birds that that have declined over that 50 year period. So it is, you know, we're, we're talking perhaps that we had about 10 billion birds. Now it's about a third less that we have over that time. So when, when, how did this first of all, how did this get on your radar? My personal radar or the yeah. organization? Yours. <laughs> Yeah. So, I I mean, again, I think that we all have direct experience uh, with it. I oversee, as you've mentioned, our bird friendly community strategy, which seeks to really, we understand that if we make our communities better for birds, we're also making them better for people. And we need to provide them with the things they need, like habitat and food and resources. But we also need to make sure that they have safe passage or they have safety in the, in these areas. And one of the major contributors to to bird uh, that that uh, affects bird populations is the built environment. You know, whether it be buildings, whether it be light, the contribution that light makes to that, communication towers, all of those things can can contribute to bird uh, injury and mortality. And this is something that, as we think holistically about how do we care for birds in our communities, this is an area that we really need to um, to address. And the thing is, everyone. Um, has solutions at hand, right? We can do things that can help birds very directly and, and quite easily in some ways. Um, in, in op- you know, if you think about things like pollution or habitat modification or destruction, those things are a little more complicated to actually uh, address. But some of the things that we can do around um, preventing collisions are relatively straightforward. And we want to encourage everybody to think about whatever space they may have um, control over that they can contribute to helping birds navigate through that. I don't want to take anything for granted or assume anything. When, when you say if a, if a jurisdiction or if an area, or, or for that matter, if the planet is better for birds, it's better for people. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean that when we make our spaces better for birds, so we're providing them with habitat, with green space, with clean air, clean water, all of those things which are vital to their survival, those are things that also benefit us. I think that we can understand that. And, you know, we could dig into that, you know, and there certainly are are data to support that, but we can understand from the perspective of if we have cleaner water in our communities, we're going to benefit from that. If we're reducing pesticides and pollutants that run into our water tables, we're all going to benefit from that, including birds and other wildlife that we share our communities with too. Dr. Roden, people can uh, reference uh, audubon.org and we'll, and we'll push the link out from our show's Twitter account at Real Talk RJ. But they're a very interesting piece. Actually, as a matter of fact, this is what prompted us to reach out to you. Uh, turning off lights at night could have bird deaths could cut them by 50 percent on chicago's lake shore can you i mean let's let's talk about this specific study i'm sure it can apply to to communities around the world but what is it about turning off lights on chicago's lake shore that could have such a huge impact yeah i mean it, it really was a fascinating study and a, and a really excellent data set that the researchers used to actually figure out and to illustrate the the impact of light so Um, Basically, what they did, they had a data set that looked at 20 years of data at McCormick uh, Place, which is a convention center right on Lake Michigan in Chicago. And what happened in in around the turn of the millennium was that they started doing a light reduction and about they they went from 100 percent lighted windows to 50 percent lighted windows on certain nights. And what they saw was that there was a decrease in the birds that were uh, were actually colliding with the windows. So what the researchers did was that they looked at that data set over a 20 year period, and they also looked at other uh, variables, including weather patterns, migration intensity. So they were trying to see what was the biggest contributors to bird collisions at this particular location. And what they found was the highest predictor of collisions was actually whether windows were lighted or not. And just by reducing the lighting uh, of windows from 100% to 50%, that could decrease the number of birds that collided with the building by 11 times in the spring migration 
and six times in fall migration. So it had a really dramatic and measurable impact if you just turned off those lights. And we're not talking about extinguishing the lights completely so that the building was completely dark, but just by cutting it by half, you could actually re really measurably reduce the collisions uh, that birds were having with the building. Obviously you could probably imply as well that there would be savings on things like electricity, probably a Absolutely. lot of arguments for doing that. I would imagine the pushback might be from, and I have no idea, but maybe from architects that would say, hang on a second. I mean, we're talking about, you know, the, these, these billion dollar properties in, in one of the most beautiful cities in the world. I mean, this was designed to be lit up. Do you think that there would be pushback from property owners, from municipalities, can you see some opposition to this? Um, it certainly is a possibility, but I think you hit on one thing that's really critical is energy savings, right? Mm -hmm. I think that one of the things that we obviously are thinking about as a major contributor to bird declines in up to now and into the future is climate change. And so if we can actually reduce our carbon footprint, we're going to be doing better for um, wildlife. And I think that, interestingly, architects you mentioned, the architects that actually we work with and, and we work with as bird conservationists across the spectrum, really as they understand the, the, in, the scale of impact um, of this issue, they're actually very willing to work across the board to, to think of solutions, whether it be in the design of the buildings or the lighting. So yes, there, are, there is an aesthetic um, desire for a lot of cities to have this, you know, beautiful skyline and everything. But I think that, that, that when we actually uh, look at the impact of the the lighting on birds and other wildlife, and even you know on ourselves, right? I think that we we are a species that is similar to birds. We didn't evolve with massive amounts of light in the night sky, so there are consequences even to human health, you know, around sleep patterns, all of those sorts of things. And so I think that if we think again holistically about how we're um, operating in the environment, thinking very um, deliberately and carefully about light, we can we can do better both for um, wildlife that we share the, our communities with, but also for ourselves too. And we can reduce energy consumption. I remember having a, a fascinating conversation. This is a few years ago now. Um, in our city, uh, a, a, an arts nonprofit wanted to put up a big flashy sort of imagine a Times Square style billboard. And there was real pushback from people that were concerned about light pollution. And we did a bit of a deep dive into it and started talking about the psychology and, like you said, the sleep impacts. And I don't think it's something really that most people think about. Uh, but it's a fascinating conversation to be had. John, I, uh, for, you know, a lot of people will listen to this podcast, and uh, but some will see this on YouTube. And so this is a photo that we want to show. This I, I hate showing this photo. Your organization was able to provide this as part of research. This is a really tough photo to look at. These are these are these are what do you call them? Carcasses. These these beautiful migratory birds. That uh, is this from one building? This there's got to be at least a hundred of them in this photo, and I, I would imagine there are many, many more. Tell us what we're seeing here. Yeah, exactly. So this is, there are oftentimes, there may be massive um, collision events that occur because there's a confluence of circumstances, right? There may be a very heavy migratory night and birds take advantage of atmospheric conditions, um, cloud cover, moon, you know, they navigate with the, the moon and the star map. So there may be conditions that contribute to massive, massive collision events. There's been, um, for example, last uh, October in Philadelphia, there was a, a single night, over 1,500 birds died and were recovered um, just in a very small area in Philadelphia. So that happens on occasion. But the again, if you think about it, even if, if it's just one bird per building per year across North America, those are massive numbers. And we know that it's not quite that. So the, the scale of the, of the problem is really massive. Are there certain species that are more susceptible to, to these types of fatal collisions? Sure. And, and I, I should be clear that there's a couple different contributing factors here, right? So there's, so artificial light at night, which is, was a big focus of the study in Chicago. Um, it, it's important because birds use, the majority of North American birds migrate at night and they use the moon and the star map to navigate by, which is a really sophisticated navigational skill and evolved in the absence of human-generated artificial light at night being broadcast in the sky. And what it can do is it can pull them off their migratory paths. It can pull them into places where 
they, there isn't good habitat, they may be subjected to building collisions because what actually kills them, right, is when they run into buildings and birds do not perceive glass as a barrier, right? Similar to us, right? We don't necessarily perceive, that's why we like it, but we have cues that tell us that, that there is glass there and they don't, they'll either see a reflection of habitat or they'll see a passageway. Mm. So um, the point is that those, these things can, can contribute to, all of those things will contribute to them um, having challenges in our built environment. And again, there's ways that we can protect them from that by, by minimizing light and by ensuring that they understand that glass is a barrier. And there are certainly ways to do that as well. Uh, Darlene's watching and she says, with regards to trying to prevent bird strikes, I have decals on our windows. We've drawn lines on the windows. Uh, The number of strikes has certainly decreased, but young birds still hit. Uh, Dr. Roden, if we if we were all to be invited over to your place right now and to take a look, how would your place look different than most of ours in the context of being proactive on this? Right. Well, so that's great for Darlene to be doing that on her windows. And one of the things that that we promote is is what we call the two by two rule, which means that if you have barriers or stickers on your window that that can show it's a barrier, that there are no more than two inches of spacing between those because birds will see small passageways, particularly if they're trying to get away from predators and will try to get through there. So, you know, your question about what birds are most commonly uh, uh, affected by this, we see hummingbirds, right? Hummingbirds, which is why we really do focus on that two by two rule that are, depending on where they are and depending on conditions may um, hit the window. And young birds too, like Darlene mentioned, again, because they're just naive to the fact that there is a barrier there are susceptible to that. Um, so at my house, we have windows that are covered with um, just, it's, it just indicates that there's a barrier there with, we use a product actually at my house um, by a Canadian company called Feather Friendly, which just puts these dots on the window that are two inches apart. They're not hugely um, obtrusive. You can still see through the window and you actually kind of forget that they're there after a while. So that's one thing. And then also around my house, we down shield the lights, right? We, we have lighting outside. We want to be able to to walk around out at, at night, but those the the um, lights have shields that keep the light directed down just to where we need it because we don't need it to be broadcast into the sky or out into our neighbor's yard or anything like that. And I'm I'm, I'm grateful to hear you make that point because I want to ask you. I mean, you know, there there's what you know we talk about the big office towers, right? Uh, but I I know that people are going to hear this and they're going to want to know what they can do right now yeah. on their property. Are residences? I mean, obviously, as we alluded to right out of the gates here, almost everybody has heard that gut wrenching sound of a bird hitting the window. Um, if if you were to speculate, or maybe you do have the research, maybe you do have the numbers. You know, office towers and skyscrapers versus residences or low rise buildings. Is it? I mean, our office towers obviously disproportionately. Uh, at fault here, or how does it all play out? Yeah, it's actually, you know, close to half of our understanding and estimates of bird um, collision deaths are happening at low rise and residential buildings. And that is because of the ubiquity, the, the, that they're more commonly spaced all over the continent, right? So there are certain concentrations in large cities where there's, there's high buildings and birds might be drawn in by the light, but residences absolutely contribute massively to the, um, to the problem across the country. And people can take, you know, they can, they can make sure that their windows are visible to birds and they can look at their lighting scheme and see if they can actually reduce that so that they're not actually contributing to that artificial light at, at night that's being broadcast into the atmosphere. This has nothing to do with birds, uh, but it has everything to do with humans. Uh, Heidi's watching. She chimes in on our live chat. She says in Costa Rica, the locals complain to us about international. I mean, she says American uh, <laughs> beach homeowners who refuse mm-hmm. to take the small step of not using red or green outdoor lights. The locals prefer the usual white or yellow lights. The reason being that the colored ones were deterring protected turtles from coming to the beach and it was affecting reproduction. That's a fascinating. I'd love to read up on that. Maybe I will once we go off air here. But it's another fascinating idea. You talk about the environmental impacts of us expanding our development, right? And and maybe how little thought actually goes into what we do to habitat and the human impact there. Do you think that 
society is is becoming more or less aware of the impact that we have on the living beings that we cohabit with here? Uh, it's a great question. And and I, I and the team I lead are working every day to try and raise that awareness. So I would, I, I, you know, in my heart, I have to feel like we are reaching more people. I think that a very interesting thing that emerged during the pandemic was that when people were forced, right, really to stay home to, um, and there were less cars on the road, what we saw is that people really started to hear more, in our case, since we work in bird conservation, hear more birds, see more birds, really start to think about and appreciate that, you know, these birds are here all the time. We just haven't really been hearing or paying attention to them. And what is, how can we help them? And so I think that there is, I have to say, I have to believe, right, that there is a growing awareness or understanding among certain, among certain, certain of us, right, to understand these things and to to help with those with these these organisms that share our communities with us. And this is again what we're we're trying to do day in and day out is to raise awareness and to provide solutions to people so that they can actually be better stewards of their environment, um, both locally and beyond. Can I ask you before we thank you for your time? Uh, we're talking to Dr. John Roden. If you're live streaming us on Mixler, if you've just popped into the show, uh, we had some fun with a, a, a poll on Twitter, uh, gauging our audience's awareness on what might prompt or cause 600 million bird deaths in the United States. Of course, the answer is, is building strikes, but some other good options on there. Uh, can we talk about feral cats or, or house cats out at night? Can we talk about plane strikes? Can we talk about wind turbines? I mean, where do all of these stack up on your list of items or realities that need to be addressed? Absolutely. So cats really is the biggest direct cause of mortality. Feral and um, outside domestic cats are the biggest uh, contributor to bird deaths in North America. So if I could tell people beyond doing things like making sure your birds can see your windows or that your lighting regime is, is reduced. If people could keep their cats indoors, that would be a massive benefit to birds. Um, they're really, cats are really killing machines and keeping them indoors will be helpful. So that is the number one thing. Building collisions would be the number two thing. And you mentioned, you know, plane collisions, wind turbines, all of that. Yes, there are contributions of that, but those are in the big scheme of things, with the huge scale that we have around collisions and around cats, they contribute less to that uh, mortality of birds. Fascinating stuff. If you want to learn more about what Dr. John Roden and his team are doing at Audubon, you can check out audubon.org. Look at that. The beautiful emperor penguin featured right there on your home page, proposed for listing under the Endangered Species Act. The work never ends, does it, Doc? That is true. And and thank you, Ryan, for helping to spread the word about this. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure meeting you. And thanks for giving us your time and your expertise today, Doc. Absolutely. My pleasure. You bet. Dr. John Roden, you can follow them uh, on Twitter at Audubon Society. Of course, Sarah Hoyles pushes that out as part of our daily announcement of who's going to be on the show, the guests that are joining us. And, and of course, if you follow us at Real Talk RJ, that's our relatively new account. You'll find also links to articles that we reference and highlights from each show. Oh, by the way, Heidi circled back and said, sorry, uh, she's taking the blame on this. She says it was poor writing. It was probably my fault. I, she, she said it was the opposite. She says the locals want in Costa Rica, they want the red and green or the different lights. They don't want the bright white or the bright yellow. Of course, everybody loves that soft yellow lighting, though, don't they? I, you don't think about things. I mean, when's the last time any of us have thought about the impact? And maybe some people have. I've seen a lot of the proactive steps that are being detailed with audience members here talking about I mean, one of our audience members said they've painted a lot of their windows here to try to prevent bird strikes. If it happens to you, if you experience it, it makes you sick to your stomach. The sound, you just feel terrible. You see like feather residue or down residue on the window and you just go, oh man, right? Yeah. Although for some people, can I make an unpopular comment? It probably depends on the type of bird that it was. Fair comment. I mean, it's real talk. The show is real talk. No. People are, people are going to care more. Not you, Hoyles. <laughs> We know not you. <laughs> Tell us something we don't know. I've seen I've seen some derogatory. There is some speciesism at play here. There really is. I won't call it bird racism, but that's exactly what it is. Nobody cares about the magpies. Nobody cares about the crows. Everybody cares about the hummingbirds. Right? 
Sam, I, you I, look like you have a strong opinion here. I will not put magpies and crows in the same bucket. Uh, really? Ma- magpies are, are Edmonton's rats. Um, but they're, they're also magnet. I, lo- I, I mean, love magpies. Yeah, I have a very I, weird love. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story. First of all, <laughs> I would still be sad if a go. magpie <laughs> flew into a window. I would. Of course. A, a bird died. Of, absolutely. I, I would like, actually really legitimately feel sad if a magpie flew into a window. Totally. I was sitting in my backyard uh, last year sometime, I want to say, and looked over my house in the spruce tree in my front yard. A magpie, you know, flew and landed on the very top of this spruce tree. And I was looking up and it was like, you know what? I think I've given magpies a bad reputation. I think that I think I got to rethink magpies a little bit more. And then that magpie pooped and flew away, and I did a full 180 right again. Well, everybody poops, Sam. There's a well, kid's know, book called Everybody Poops. But, like, on display I thought for you were, everybody I thought, to I, see. I thought you were going to say the magpie raided a robin's nest or something. Well, yeah, they do that, too. Yeah. yeah. You know, well, I'll say, I was, I was uh, because I'm, I'll, let me say, a lack of knowledge does not stop me from offering up hot takes. Uh, never has, as a matter of fact. Just ask my elementary school teachers. And I saw because we have a we have a, a hanging our yard. We've got a lot of bird activity in our yard. And we have some nesting boxes and bird houses, and we love it. And surrounded by trees. And um, but you know what I'm getting really annoyed at is like we 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 ponied up for like the really fancy food. And I was promised by our expert that some of this was going to draw in some of the birds we rarely see. We're still waiting for them. But we got a bunch of the, you know, the more common birds which come on by and hang out with us, which is fine by me. But we have a peanut feeder. It's like a like it looks like a wreath shape and you can come in and it's designed to to attract blue jays. And it does and it works. And the blue jays to me are just super cool birds. If you live in certain parts of Ontario or the parts of Canada where you see them all the time, you're kind of like, yeah, blue jays, blue jays in some communities are like magpies to us. But for me, seeing a blue jay is really special. Mm-hmm. And the magpies were starting to come in on the blue jays and chase them away. And I was getting really agitated. And so I, I did what every Canadian does. And I tweeted about it. I was so agitated. And I was quickly schooled by people that were like, Blue jays are arguably bigger pricks than magpies. If you actually read up on blue jays and how they treat other birds, magpies come out looking pretty good. Uh, And I realize it's just like in the ocean. It's like, you know, people will see a dolphin abused or they'll see a whale targeted and they're like, "Ah!" Some other fish, nobody nobody gives a crap about some of the other fish. Nobody cares. The tuna. The tuna. The, the tuna. Beautiful animal, that tuna. A friend of mine from Nova Scotia was visiting, and he was like, what is that beautiful, majestic bird? It's black, and it's got, like, it's luminous. And uh, it's like, that's a magpie. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I think they're beautiful. Uh, the other thing is, is if I'm not mistaken, when you get the crows and you get the magpies, that's basically telling you that you've got a really healthy bird population because those big dudes are swooping in for the food and to pester the other birds. Yeah. Troy says, I'm the weird one who loves magpies. I think that they're the most beautiful bird. Troy, you and me both, pal. I mean, I have a, I have a magpie pin. Uh, Black and white, glossy. I'll wear it on my tuxedo sometimes. Remember back like about two years ago, people used to get together and hang out and raise money for things. And I have this tuxedo that actually used to fit. Actually used to fit quite nicely. And I would always proudly, if I was if I was doing an event that was very Edmonton centric, I would I would proudly wear that magpie pin on my lapel. Uh, we also have some suggestions on how you can keep magpies out of your yard. They are all absolutely sadistic, and I'm not reading them, James. That is a comment for you. Arnold, meantime, says he only cares about crows and magpies. Paula points out quite rightfully that birdism is among us. This will be one of the isms that we will tackle on this show. Uh, before we get into uh, one of our favorite uh, features of the week, I want to remind you that Trash Talk is coming up tomorrow. You've still got time to submit your rant, your gripe. What is it driving you nuts? Maybe we'll get one on birdism. Maybe we'll get one on bird racism. You never know what we might get. Talk at ryanjesperson.com is where you can submit it. It's presented by the team at Local Waste. They're in business as we speak in Alberta and Saskatchewan, always looking to grow their footprint. If you're an entrepreneur who sees an opportunity in your community, get in touch with them via the links at localwaste.ca. They pride themselves on integrity, a family-owned business for more than 25 years. 
Same deal with St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. Family-owned dealerships with the best selection of Ram trucks and Jeeps in the entire province. Bar none. It's because they share their inventories. Choices are tough now. Selection's tough. Everybody's getting outside. Everybody's trying to get out camping. And if you're trying to find a truck right now that ticks all those boxes, your best bet is to start at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. You can find them under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. That's also where you'll find the team at Kubi Energy. What an exciting Tuesday morning it was with positive reflections as we were able to announce the results of the vote that hundreds of you, almost 800 of you, chimed in on, of course, awarding the Winifred Stewart Society that Real Talk Net Zero Solar Giveaway. It means that Joey's home, in honor of the great Joey Moss, will be receiving clean, free energy for the next 30 years. Thanks to Kubi Energy and thanks to you, the real talkers that voted for them. Each and every Thursday, courtesy of our friends at Prairie Catering, we offer somebody an opportunity to eat your words. And this week, a shout out to the Canadian women's soccer team who, by the way, Friday morning, the time's been changed, Friday morning at 5 o'clock Pacific, 6 o'clock Mountain, 8 a.m. Eastern, they will take on Sweden for the gold medal. It's because they beat the Americans. You might have heard. 1-0. The first time they've beat the American women in 20 years. It prompted this quote, which has been making the rounds, from Megan Rapino, who said, It's a bitter one to swallow. Obviously, we never want to lose to Canada. I don't think I've ever lost to Canada. And, despicable... Franklin Graham, yeah, the son of Billy, the famous evangelical, the guy behind Samaritan's Purse tweeted, the U.S. women's Olympic soccer team lost to Canada for the first time in 20 years, and I think a lot of people saw it coming. It seems they've lost their focus and instead became more focused on political wokeness and using the Olympic stage to promote their agendas. Or maybe, Franklin... It's just because the Canadians were better. Better organized, better coached, more fit, more ready for the pressure, and primed to win that gold medal. So why don't the two of you take some back bacon, sprinkle it around, drizzle it in maple syrup, and eat your words. Presented by Prairie Catering. Now, this is just a reminder that Prairie Catering right now is offering an opportunity for you to check out the beautiful Art Gallery of Alberta. They offer catering delivered, of course, but they're also able to see you in person hosting your event from large to small. They can take up to 300 people, you know. You'll get 20% off any rental space at the Art Gallery of Alberta for your next corporate function when you mention... Eat your words on Real Talk, valid only for 2021 rental dates. You should have never told me that we can do that with the audio impact because now all my mind does is come up with different ways that we could present reverberating sound. Now, I know that a lot of you were moved by what we talked to Dr. Joe Vipond about. And of course, we're going to continue to have conversations around health policy, but Here's where we're going to issue you a call to action. Every week, the team at Y Station, they're our official research and strategy partners. They present our question of the week. And before we sign off today, I want to direct your attention to our website, ryanjesperson.com. If you click on the question of the week this week, in partnership with Y Station, we know we've asked you a lot of COVID questions since the show started, but this one in Alberta, moving on from these COVID restrictions, that's a major development. As Dr. Vipon pointed out, it's been making national news day after day. We want to get your take on the nuances behind these measures. And so in this edition of Get Real, our question of the week, we want to know what among these changes do you think are reasonable? What do you think are reckless? And how do you feel about some of the consequences? Now, I'm really proud of how this has been worded, and the team worked hard on this. We've tried as best we can to keep the partisan politics out of this, and we want to just tap into how you're feeling. 
Now, this gives us great insight into where the audience is at. This is your chance to have your say. And of course, early next week, we will present, we will review the results of this question of the week. I encourage you to do it today. It's going to take you literally three minutes. You go to ryanjesperson.com and you click on question of the week. It's right at the top of the page. Before we sign off, I want to remind you that the team at Friesen Brothers, I've been talking about their barbecue sauce a lot. I know that right now because they're super proud to have just released their very own Friesen Brothers branded barbecue sauce. And it might, quite frankly, be the best barbecue sauce in the world. Grilling season, this is their wheelhouse. And at their 16 locations across the province of Alberta, a reminder, they've got the best Alberta proteins. They've got the best Alberta produce, plus those Friesen Brothers barbecue sauces for 60 six years Friesen Brothers has been Alberta grown and Alberta owned we also wanted to remind you that if you check out landscapeedmonton.ca today is a perfect time to start dreaming of what your backyard your front porch or wherever it is that you know could use improvement what could it look like if the team at Eden Landscaping were to bring your outdoor space to life They've been working with clients. They've been ensuring people's satisfaction for more than 20 years, whether it's natural beauty, an ultra-modern design, or stunning stonework. This is what they do. You can find Eden Landscaping, again, at landscapeedmonton.ca. I can't believe that it's Friday already. Tomorrow morning, our roundtable is going to get into what subsidized, supported childcare really could look like. We talked to Minister Jim Carr about this yesterday. Is $10 a day childcare actually possible across the country? Plus, other news as it develops and trash talk still to come. That's tomorrow on Real Talk. In the meantime, make it a great day. The gun on-